Hi, everyone. Uh, this is the According to John podcast. And today we are going to have a debate. It's the first debate on uh, this channel and podcast. So it will be very interesting for me also. Um, we have the guests we have is Father Patrick Ramsey and Dr. Gavin Utlund. And the debate, uh, the question we are going to debate is, is the Orthodox Church the only one true church? So uh, Father Patrick has, a deg has degrees both in science and theology. He's a distant tutor for the Institute for Orthodox Christian Studies in Cambridge, UK, and has a PhD in Orthodox Christian Ecclesiology. Dr. Gavin is a Baptist pastor and has a PhD from Fuller uh, Theological Seminary in Historical Theology and a Master of Divinity from a Covenant Theological Seminary. He's the author of several books on theology also, and he writes uh, on the uh, internet on different topics uh, related to theology. So welcome both to the debate. Thank you. Thanks, John. How are you doing? Are you doing fine this time? Yes, thank you. Yes, so well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the debate format uh, will be, part one will be 15 minutes, uh, first statements. Then we will go on to part two, which will be the rebuttal period. First seven minutes each, and then five minutes each, uh, the second rebuttal. Then we will go on to part three, where we will have cross-examination, 15 minutes each. And during this period, uh, the person that is cross-examining, he can interrupt or move on with uh, the, his questions if he wants. So that, that's not rude if that happens. And part four will be closing statements, five minutes, and then we will have a Q&A. So this debate is uh, pre-recorded, but I have gathered some questions uh, beforehand. Okay, uh, Father Patrick, you can begin with your first 15 minutes first uh, statement. Thank you. I'll begin my argument by focusing on the gospel and in particular, what it is to be saved. Salvation is union with God, being one with God. Theosis. Holy Father, keep them in thy name which thou gave, have given to me, that they may be one, just as we are. Union with God, the Father, is through and in the Son of God, hence the name Christ, hence the name Christian. I am not praying for these alone, but also for those who believe in me through their word, so that they may all be one, just as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee that they may also be one in us, so that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou hast given me, I have given to them, so that they may be one just as we are one. And I in them and thou in me, so they may be perfected in unity, and so that the world may know that thou hast sent me. And thou loved them just as thou loved me. Father, I desire that those whom also whom thou gave me may be with me where I am, so that they may behold my glory, which thou gave to me, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. God became man, that man may become God. And the glory that thou have given to me, I have given to them. We are united to God according to both aspects of our human constitution. That is both spiritually, by faith, knowledge, and love in the Holy Spirit, and bodily, through baptism and water, and in the offering and partaking of the Eucharist, the one bread and one cup, the body and blood of Christ and also through the practice of the virtues and avoiding sin. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, stay sober, put your hope fully in the grace brought to you 
for at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves after the former lusts as you did in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all manner of life because it is written, be holy for I am holy. We become one in mind with God and one body through and in Christ, who is the head. Because God is one without the visions or contradictions. We need to be united in one mind and one body, so that we are all one or all of the same opinion. Now I beseech you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but you be made complete in the same mind and in the same opinion and one body by partaking of one bread. For we be many are one bread and one body, for we all partake from the one bread and thus in one communion with each other. There is one body and one spirit, just as also you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in us all. What is the church? The church is the body of Christ. He is the head of the body, the church, and the household of God, the house of God, which is the church of the living God, built upon the foundations of the apostles, as fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, being built together upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. The church, as tangibly present on earth, is that institution so founded on the apostles, apostolic tradition, and we know its existence in each place because in each place we find Christ and the apostles in the presence of an Orthodox bishop and presbyters upon whom the church in each place is founded. And I also say to you that you are Peter and upon this rock, I shall build my church. That is the rock founding the church is that grounded on an appointed apostle confessing the right faith of Christ. Only with the bishop and presbyters can anything be called church because the church only exists on the foundation of Christ and the apostles. In like manner, that all reverence the deacons as the appointment of Jesus Christ and the bishop as Jesus Christ, who is the son of the father and the presbyters as the Sanhedrin of God and the assembly of the apostles. Apart from these, nothing may be called church. As wrote Sir Ignatius of Antioch, just around about 100 AD. The bishops and presbyters are not self-appointed, but appointed by those appointed before them, back in succession to those appointed by the apostles to appoint bishops and presbyters in each city, just as St. Titus. For this reason I left you behind in Crete, so that you would set in order the things that are lacking, and you should appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. How do we know the true faith of the church? As the church has spread and settled, there arose various opinions, heresies, that taught ideas contrary to the faith once delivered to all by the apostles so that the matter did not devolve to one opinion against another opinion, the bishops, as each representing the church in each place, gathered together to provide a common testimony to one and the same opinion of the received faith, as opposed to the innovation of heresy. Initially, these gatherings, called councils or synods, were regional in extent, and usually addressed a local matter sufficiently. Heresies begin as novelties in a specific place and time. These councils, or some prominent bishops, 
sometimes produced a document outlining core elements of the faith. At the time of Constantine the Great, due to the widespread heresy of Arianism, there was a general gathering of the bishops from across the world, an ecumenical council. And at that meeting, the bishops or fathers produced a statement of faith, the Nicene Creed, as a standard confession for those seeking to join the church to ensure that they were not following the heresy of Arius. Just under 60 years later, another ecumenical council was called to deal with a new widespread heresies, and the council produced a second creed of faith, fully consistent with that of Nicaea, that addressed these new heresies. This creed of Constantinople became the universally accepted confession or standard of faith for all churches and Christians. Whoever could not agree with the statements of this creed were not considered to be Christians. Other heresies arose and other ecumenical councils were held to refute them. And these councils produced statements of faith on the specific heresy as establishing what it was and was not Christian belief. No other creeds were produced though as concise statements of faith. Those rejecting the testimony of these councils became cut off from the church for rejecting the testimony of faith and so breaking the unity of mind and opinion, so as making it impossible to remain in one body of the church. Since the unity of faith and hierarchical communion was broken, these groups could no longer be said to be part of the church, nor represent the Christian faith. They went out from us, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out in order that they may not be, they may be made manifest that none of them were of us. Why the Orthodox Church? The Orthodox Church, or rather the communion of Orthodox Catholic churches, recognizes itself as a continuation of the church or churches founded by the apostles. This is established in two minutes. First is the maintenance of the apostolic faith once delivered to all the saints without change, neither adding nor subtracting from it, as well as the traditions of the apostles in the practice of the church tradition. These are testified by the ecumenical and regional councils and individual fathers that are held as inspired testimonies to the apostolic deposit or tradition. The churches also claim an unbroken line of succession from those ordained by the apostles and are continuing into communion with those other churches teaching and practicing the same things. This communion is established for recognition and communion with the apostolic or patrine seeds of Rome as in New Rome, Alexandria and Antioch, who remain as rocks of the faith of the unity of the churches as one body on earth. Sadly, others have left this communion because they refuse to accept the apostolic faith and traditions and to be with one mind with this communion, or they wish to maintain their own institutions separate from that appointed by the apostles. Such a refusal to accept the truth or unity of hierarchy denies unity with Christ as one body. And in that state, there is no possibility of recognition of these churches or as members of the body of Christ. Groups that establish themselves later apart from the church even if not opposed to the faith of the church, are nonetheless not united with the church because they do not receive their hierarchy from the church. They're not one body with the church. Just as membership in the family or nation is established primarily by birth into that family, as with Israel ancestors, so too as being a member of the church. One must be born into the church by a father of the church, a priest, who can trace his heritage to an apostle. To be recognized as in the church requires one to come to the church and to be received by the hierarchy of the church through the mysteries, so that physical union may be established where there is union of faith. This also requires a formal rejection of any errors or heresies 
and open acceptance of a faith and tradition of the church. There cannot be an external recognition of other groups outside the church, as they are, are even, if they, even if they claim to have the same faith and tradition, because a physical unity through the mysteries is not established. They have not been born again in the household of God, and so a foreign nation and a foreign people. As such, it is impossible to speak of any other group as church existing apart from the Orthodox Church and not established from her and in her as mother of all Christians. The claim that the Orthodox Church is the one and only Church of Christ is not an attempt to exclude anyone from salvation, but a necessity of what the Church is and what it is to be saved. To accept those outside the church as though they're in the church is effectively to deny the church and their salvation. The church desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. And her arms are open to all who wish to come to her in accepting her faith and the fathers as their own. It's not that the church is trying to exclude anybody, but that those outside the church claiming that it is exclusive are not willing to accept the faith and fathers of a church as their own, but rather to be justified and accepted with their own fathers and their own faith or opinions. Because the church cannot accept within herself opinions contrary to herself, all the fathers of another household as denying herself, it is rather those rejecting her or not willing to accept their own, reject their own opinions that exclude themselves from the church and from salvation. The church cries for them, but cannot force them into a church as being free in the image of God. Again, salvation is union with God as one, thus one church and one faith. Thank you, Father, for that. Uh, now it's time for Dr. Gavin to give his uh, first statement. Uh, your uh, mic. Yep. There we go. Sorry. I want to thank both John and Father Patrick for this debate. I'm very honored to be a part of it, and I pray that it will honor Christ and advance the truth. In my opening remarks, I want to argue that Orthodox Christians can certainly be a part of the church, but the Orthodox Church does not constitute the only one true church. Now, let's start by considering how radical this proposition is. If the Orthodox Church were the only true church, then of the roughly 2.3 billion Christians on planet Earth, less than 12% of them are in the church. Now, immediately, this raises the question, what does that entail for the unfortunate 88% of Christendom, roughly 2 billion people? Are we to suppose that when Jesus looks down upon his precious bride, his body in this world, his sheep, the ones for whom he died, this precious entity we call the church that he sees only Orthodox Christians. The Roman Catholics are out, the Anglicans are out, Pentecostals are out and so forth. Well, different Orthodox Christians will construe this a bit differently today, but the historic Orthodox view is very restrictive, about as restrictive as you can imagine. From the fourth council of Constantinople in the ninth century to the patriarchal encyclical of 1848 in the 19th and pretty consistently between them, the regular claim is that perceived Western innovations such as the filioque are heresy and heresy places you outside the canonical boundaries of the Orthodox Church, therefore cut off from the grace of the Holy Spirit given in the sacraments and therefore yes outside of salvation. Patriarch Dositheus of Jerusalem in the 17th century put it like this quote, when these forsake the church, they are forsaken by the Holy Spirit. And there remains in them neither understanding nor light, but only darkness and blindness, unquote. The 18th century Orthodox theologian Paisius Velichovsky, who is a saint in the Orthodox Church, put it like this, speaking of those who accept the filioque clause, quote, what hope do they have for salvation unless they openly renounce this spirit-fighting heresy and become united again with the Holy Orthodox Eastern Church? Depart and flee from them as speedily as possible, lest death overtake you in it, and you be numbered among the heretics and not among the Christians, end quote. I could produce many juicy quotes like this from Orthodox saints. 
And to my awareness, you don't start seeing any change on that until more recent times, maybe 19th century, certainly 20th century. Now, part of what is undergirding this claim is a particular construal of the unity of the church, according to which division in the church is ontologically impossible. There can never be schisms in the church. There can only be schisms from the church, so that Roman Catholics and Protestants are understood as just the next heretical movements after the Arians and the Gnostics and so forth in the early church. But why should we accept such a narrow definition of schism? In 1 Corinthians 11.18, Paul acknowledges the reality of schismata in the church in Corinth, schisms, and yet he sees all of these different groups as part of the church. Similarly, after the split between Israel and Judah in the Old Testament, God still refers to both entities of, as his people. Why can we not allow for imperfections in the church's realization of her unity, just as we must certainly do so with the other marks of the church, such, such as holiness? When we look at Christendom today, we see numerous traditions that produce saints, that have advanced the knowledge of Christ, that promote the worship of the Trinity. The divisions between them are serious, but they are not of the same rank as the divisions in the early church between, say, the church and the Gnostics or the Arians. To adopt such a one-size-fits-all definition of schism is ungenerous and unreasonable and doesn't even work for the Orthodox Church, for we have ongoing schism between Moscow and Constantinople at this very moment. Another part of the rationale for the Orthodox claim to be the only true church is her definition of apostolicity, according to which the true church is identified by, among other things, a succession of bishops going back to the apostles. But of course, there's an immediate difficulty here. The same appeal to apostolic session, succession is claimed by many Christian traditions. Within Protestantism, among Anglicans and some Lutherans, among Roman Catholics, within the old Catholic Church, and then in various other Eastern traditions, most of Christendom says, our church has the bishops who are the real successors of the apostles. Upon what basis do we negotiate these competing claims? For example, the six Oriental Orthodox churches consider themselves to comprise the one holy Catholic and apostolic church founded by Jesus Christ. Why should we accept the Eastern Orthodox claim of apostolicity over and against the Oriental Orthodox claim of the same? To make juridical and historical lines of succession through bishops a necessary ingredient of apostolicity results in a narrow and overly technical conception of ecclesiological transmission. We must pursue a more comprehensive, full-orbed understanding of how the true church subsists throughout history. Among the church fathers, for instance, succession of office was not so much itself the indicator of the true church, as much as it was wielded for the larger purpose of protecting a succession of the faith. For instance, in his oration on Athanasius, Gregory of Nazianzus is praising Athanasius's piety. And he speaks of him succeeding to the throne of St. Mark, uh, that is the see of Alexandria. And he says that the genuine ground of succession is not a succession of office, but a succession of piety and unity in the faith. If you don't have those things, then he says it's not a real succession, but a succession in name only. He even claims that a succession of office without succession of piety is, or doctrine, is a succession of health to disease, light to darkness, calm to storm, and prudence to frenzy. And by the way, I work very hard to try not to take the church fathers out of context. I know that's a concern with Protestants at, at times. So I encourage people to go look up that passage. I think they'll find it fascinating. Gregory of Nazianzus, Oration 21, on the great Athanasius chapter eight. You can find it at New Advent. Other church fathers as well emphasize the necessity of considering a church's doctrine to see if she is the true church, even if you have valid succession of office. Ambrose in his commentary on Luke 9, 5, quote, it is therefore first and foremost to inquire into the faith of a church. If Christ is its inhabitant, it must certainly be chosen. But if a people of evil faith or a heretical doctor disfigures the dwelling, it is considered a synagogue to be shunned, end quote. St. Augustine on the unity of the church, 4.7, quote, whoever dissents from Holy Scripture concerning the head, that is Christ, is not in the church, even if he is found in all places in which the church is designated, end quote. Of course, the cardinal articulation of this principle is Galatians 1, where Paul says not even apostolic status not even angelic status 
can continue apart from fidelity to the gospel. Now, of course, the Orthodox Church claims both succession of office and doctrine, but here the challenge emerges. So do other churches. What do you do when you have multiple mutually exclusive claims of apostolic succession from different Episcopal bodies, all claiming their doctrine is the right doctrine? Here's how one Roman Catholic theologian poses the challenge, quote, the slightest acquaintance with church history witnesses to the fact that the presence of bishops is not an adequate criterion for discerning the true church of the apostolic succession amidst conflicting Episcopal bodies. Who could be ignorant? of the scandalous reality of bishops at dogmatic odds with one another for centuries, bishops against bishops, councils against councils, who cannot readily acknowledge that every major schism and heresy throughout history has been promoted by bishops who invariably claimed to defend tradition and orthodoxy, end quote. In Holy Scripture, not only do we have no promise that succession of office and succession of uh, piety and doctrine will coincide, but in fact, we see precisely the opposite consistently throughout the Old Testament and climactically in the New Testament. The one who led the plot to crucify Jesus Christ was Caiaphas, who could claim unbroken succession from Aaron. This is why John the Baptist is warning the Jewish leaders in Matthew 3, who cares if you have Abraham as your father while you're not repenting of your sins? We must not understand the transmission of the church from one generation to another in a mechanical way as though she were a kind of legal property that could be handed off. As Karl Barth objected, for such a definition of apostolicity, neither the Holy Spirit nor faith is necessary, but simply an archeological knowledge of lists. Instead, the true church can be discerned wherever Jesus Christ is present in word and sacrament. The church is created by the dynamic activity of the risen Christ according to his free and sovereign will in advancing the gospel. For instance, in the book of Acts, the church spreads organically and unpredictably as believers are scattered because of persecution. The gospel comes to Antioch in Acts 11 because people are scattered after the persecution of Stephen. They speak the gospel in Greek. Uh, people respond to the gospel and the church is grown. And when Barnabas is sent there from Jerusalem, he doesn't say, well, we've got to have a laying on of hands to make this legitimate. He simply encourages them in their faith and rejoices in what is happening. This is a Protestant ecclesiological instinct to perceive the true church as first an organism and then an institution rather than first an institution and then an organism. Now, to be clear, it is not that the forms of institutional succession are useless or bad. It's simply that they are not strictly necessary. The institutional serves the organic. It does not enclose and limit it. Thus today, when in a remote part of the world, uh, people suddenly get access to the internet and they go to biblegateway.com and encounter the gospel and respond to the gospel with faith and worship and baptism, the church of Jesus Christ is grown even apart from a formal institutional connection with other pre-existing churches. Now here a question emerges. What about the early Christians who do insist upon bishops? And Father Patrick has mentioned some of them thus far. We must read these statements in context. For instance, consider the famous passage where Tertullian appeals to the succession of bishops to determine the true church. Well, if you keep reading, right after that he says, even if the heretics had a succession of bishops, it wouldn't matter because their doctrine is bad. Quote, but should they even affect the contrivance of a succession list, they will not advance a step. For their very doctrine, after comparison with that of the apostles, will declare by its own diversity and contrariety that it had for its author neither an apostle nor an apostolic man, end quote. This makes it clear that for Tertullian, succession of office is not itself the criterion. It's helping you to discern the larger criterion, the succession of the faith. These early Christians like Irenaeus and Tertullian were under enormous pressure in this critical stormy early period of the church, church's growth. Persecutions without, heresies and schisms are within. In response to this, there's the development of a more hierarchical centralized church structure for the sake of maintaining unity and continuity with apostolic teaching. An appeal to apostolic succession makes a lot of sense if you're two or three generations removed from the apostles. If you're Irenaeus and you know of the apostle John through Polycarp, of course you're going to appeal to that. It does not follow that an appeal, from that appeal, that a succession of bishops will then roll forward indefinitely into the future for thousands of years via the laying on of hands as the way you mark out the one true church. 
we must also appreciate that the schisms and heresies being addressed by these church fathers are not comparable to many of the schisms in the church today. For instance, Cyprian, who insisted, of course, on the necessity of bishops, wrote his On the Unity of the Church to address Novation, who was an anti-pope. His famous statement that you cannot have God as your father unless you have the church as your mother in chapter six is said with reference to the one who is an enemy of Christ, scattering the church, and has committed spiritual adultery. That's the person he considers outside of the church. Similarly, his famous statement that outside of the church there is no salvation in Epistle 72 to Jubianus, he's, he's addressing the baptism of heretics. And he lists heresies such as Patripassianism, uh, various Gnostic groups, people who deny the Trinity, the Marcionites. He spends a lot of time on Marcion, for example. So Marcion, Marcion rejected the God of the Old Testament. He had a Docetist view of the incarnation. He elevated Paul over the other apostles. That's the kind of person he's talking about in his context. Similarly, in his famous statement in Epistle 68, that if anyone is not with the bishop, he's not in the church, this is a letter against his arch enemy, or one of them, Florentius Pupianus, who's been viciously criticizing him, and Cyprian calls him sacrilegious and says God is going to judge him. That is the context for Cyprian's statements. Those are the kinds of people he thinks of as not with the bishop. These schisms in the early church are different than the schism of, for instance, 1054. That was a more institutional schism between Orthodox groups. It was not even immediately universal. It took a while to spread. The doctrinal differences between a Cyprian and a Marcion are far more aggravated than the doctrinal differences between various Christian groups today. It's anachronistic to extend Cyprian's language without qualification into the post-1054 era. Cyprian never faced such a world. But if Cyprian's statements about schism, schism are applied to today, we should apply them all consistently. And that includes his assertion that there's no salvation outside the church, which means 88% of Christians are damned. I am thankful that most contemporary Orthodox Christians would not push Cyprian's statements that far, but in so doing, they recognize his statements came in a different context. I'm out of time, so I'll address Ignatius in my next rebuttal. Thank you, Dr. Gavin. Uh, so now we move on to part two. And uh, you, Father uh, Patrick, you can give your first rebuttal, which will be seven minutes. Right, thank you. Thank you for your argument, Gavin. <laughs> um, right, my rebuttal of this is the core of it is there's an assumption that somehow we talk about Christians as outside the Orthodox Church. And the question is, on what basis do we say that those outside the Orthodox Church are, can be called Christians? That we can say that 88% of Christians are outside the church. In the Orthodox perspective, the Christians are in the church. Those who are outside the church, at uh, cease to be Christians. Now, uh, having said that, that does not mean in an academic sense, in a sense of um, economy or discussion, where we can recognize those who have some connection to Christ or things are Christians as distinct from being Buddhists or Hindus or Muslims even, but that does not mean in the strict sense of what that means to be a Christian, which is to be in Christ, the practical real life or existence of a Christian. So we keep those terms distinct from each other. So there's an assumption in, in, the, in the reply, uh, the argument that their Christians exist or have are part of the flock or somehow on some basis other than what is determined by the church or being within the church as it is manifest on earth. Now, the, it also discusses the idea of schism as being in and out. But schism isn't necessarily a, an absolute black and white. Schism is bad, yes, the, and properly there can no re, a real schism within the church. But that is in the sense of a schism that cuts one off completely from the unity of the churches. They can be, and this is what I would describe as a garment ripped in two, whereas there is a complete break 
of hierarchical or union with any of the hierarchy of the church. You become completely separated from the body. That is one level of schism. Then there are schisms internal, which are like tears in the garment, such that one part of the garment is broken from another part of the garment. But it does not mean that the garment itself is torn in two. And this is a case between Moscow and Constantinople. They remain part of the one garment through the communal union with other patriarchates, such as that of Serbia and uh, Antioch. But unfortunately, they are torn. And these happen throughout the history of the church. Yes, the church, the Orthodox churches do not claim to be free from every single little tear in the garment. These do happen within the church. But what it's talking about with major schism is where the, there is a complete break in hierarchical communion. And then there's something about the claim that the modern heresy or modern teachings of Protestantism or Roman Catholicism are somehow less heresies than in the past. Now, in the past, we do have some major heresies and Protestants and Roman Catholics will not teach Arianism. They will accept that Christ is the son of God. Um, However, in the past, there were also heresies about minor matters. It was considered even if you rejected second marriage, you were a heretic. The novations, for example, were um, orthodox, were heresies, were very, in every way orthodox, but there were still heresies for one reason or another. And even those who wished to worship on the um, Easter or celebrate Easter on the 14th day were in some ways called heretics were falsely teaching outside the unity of the church and considered in a sense outside the church. They had to be received into the church through repentance. So the teachings of the Roman Catholics and Protestants now are in the same ballpark of the variations of heresies in the past. So we're not talking about something different. And who is to judge what heresy is what? James says, if you break one law, even a minor one, you break the entire law. There is no real sense of saying one heresy is more important than the other. The issue is it contrary to the tradition of the church and the faith of the church. If it is, it divides, because in God there is no, he's pure. He doesn't have a partial sense of what's okay and partial sense of lie in him. He's utterly pure. There is only truth. And so any lie, any change is itself to visit from the church. And uh, one cannot claim, oh, I've got less or another. No, if you're not teaching the same faith and tradition as the church, then you are separated. Um, how much time have we got left, if I may? Uh, two minutes. Thank you. Um, Open exposition is of faith and piety. I think it was recognized that the succession of bishops has to be orthodox. There is every bishop's ordained with the creed, with the gospel. He is ordained only to be, in a sense, an orthodox line. But this claim that it's about orthodox does not mean that the succession is established simply by faith, because the faith is, it has to come together. The succession has to be laying on of hands, from the apostles, etc., in faith. So we can't divorce the two. We can't use this as an argument that we, because we have to have faith, that we that there's somehow the succession is irrelevant. No, the succession must come with the faith. The two come hand in hand. And yes, rightly without the faith, succession in itself is meaningless. But that does not mean that just the faith itself adds the same as the succession. And the next last bit is. Um, Yes, that the heretics all claim that different, the true, the true truth. Of course they do. Otherwise, they wouldn't say, oh, we're not the church. <laughs> they will join us. The, but the issue is then, is what is the true faith? Who is consistent with the fathers? Who is holding the, 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 the test, common testimony is passed down? Who is holding the Nicene Creed, the Constantinople? Who is agreeing with it? Who is agreeing with the fifth? third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh ecumenical councils, the eighth ecumenical councils. Who is holding these in agreement? If they're not holding these in agreement, then it's clear that they are not in one mind with the church and they cut themselves off. Now, if you are not within that agreement, you have to choose what is a faith that is consistent, just as you accept Christ over Buddha or Muhammad. This is a matter of faith, a choice of faith, as to and as determining which church is truly claiming 
the matter? Yes, there's a lot of reasons, a lot of, we can find out a lot by examining the truth, the consistency of it. But again, it falls down to it's a matter of faith. And this in itself does not deny that there's one faith, one church, or the claims of um, one church. Yes. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, now, Dr. Gavin, it's your turn uh, for uh, seven minutes rebuttal. Okay, thank you, Father Patrick. Uh, let me say a few comments of a more general nature at the beginning, and then I'll give a few comments by way of reply. Uh, first of all, just to reiterate two larger points in the discussion. First of all, even if we accept the necessity of bishops, my question of why Eastern Orthodox rather than Oriental Orthodox is still on the table. There's an assertion that one of these churches is the true church and the other is not, but the difference between them is purely doctrinal, not historical, and highly technical. So I want to reiterate that question. Second, um, the, in the early church, the episcopate evolved in a particular context. We must appreciate that context. Now, let me uh, extend this observation a little bit with reference to Ignatius because he's been introduced. We have to recognize the development in this model. And you see this with some of the eccentricities of Ignatius's view of the bishop. Ignatius, though he insists upon the bishop, does not believe in apostolic succession. He does not think the bishops are the successors of the apostles. He instead associates the presbyters with the apostles. Furthermore, he doesn't think of the bishops as having a diocesan jurisdiction, but a congregational one. He has a fundamentally different definition of the word bishop. Bishop is not over a region for him. He's just like the pastor of the church. This starts to make more sense when you consider all of the apostolic fathers. In the early second century, we have the shepherd of Hermas referencing multiple times presbyters presiding over the church in Rome. In Polycarp's epistle to the Philippians, chapters five and six, we have qualifications for two offices, presbyters and deacons. Back into the extra biblical first century evidence, we have the Didache 15.1, which instructs churches to appoint two offices, bishops and deacons. Similarly, in the first epistle of Clement, 42 to 44, uh, the we're told that the church has two offices. And chapter 57 references the church in Corinth being led by a group of presbyters. In the New Testament, every reference to church leadership without exception is always in the plural. And the terms bishop and presbyter are used interchangeably. There's many evidences of this. Just for the sake of time to mention one, we've got two qualifications lists. These are extremely important to tell you about the office in question. Titus 1, 1 Timothy 3. Not only are the list of qualifications unmistakably parallel, but the terms are used reverted back and forth in Titus 1. The logic is appoint presbyters if they are blameless, for a bishop must be blameless. Now, the greater office can include the lesser, but not vice versa. There's no way to understand Paul's language unless we accept that these two offices were not yet distinguished. The evidence accords with the interpretation of Jerome in the early church, as well as a near consensus of academic historians of early Christianity today, namely that there was a development from a two office structure to a three office structure. Francis Sullivan, a Roman Catholic theologian summarizes it like this, quote, there exists a broad consensus among scholars, including most Catholic ones, that such churches as those in Alexandria, Philippi, Corinth, and Rome, most probably continued to be led for some time by a college of presbyters, and that only during the course of the second century did the threefold structure generally become the rule with a bishop presiding over each local church, end quote. Now, this does not mean that the monarchical Episcopal structure is wrong. It simply means that it lacks jura divino. It's not by divine right. Rather, it's a development to meet the needs of the time. Almost every institution goes through this kind of evolution after the founder or founders are gone. They become more institutionalized. Uh, it's not surprising that the early church, under the threat of heresy and schism, felt a need for a more centralized form of organization. And you can see further continual developments, such as archbishops, which emerge in the fifth century. We also have to appreciate the imperial context in which the early church is evolving. All seven ecumenical councils were convoked by the Roman emperor, Gregory the Great claimed God set the emperor as the guardian of the peace of the church and the one who preserves the unity of the priesthood. There's all kinds of canons of early synods specifying all the specific ways the, the emperor relates to the churches, how you make an appeal to the emperor, etc. Now, if consider the differences in context from the early church to today. In the time of Cyprian, in the mid-third century, there was about one million Christians all within the Roman Empire. Today, there are 2.3 billion at least professing Christians. Uh, 
When you go from 1 million people in the Roman Empire to 2.3 billion people, a growth of over 2,000 times all over the planet, it would be absurd to expect the same kind of institutional structure and procedure in both circumstances. In fact, if you fast forward just a millennium, the episcopate is serving a very different purpose. If you happen to be a lay Christian in Western Europe in the late medieval era, you're facing indulgences, you're being financially manipulated by indulgences, you're being starved of the sacrament, you don't get communion in both kinds, and you don't get either kind very often, you're ignorant of the word of God, because there's official resistance to translation into the vernacular, and you may well be getting persecuted. The Western Church claimed the power of the temporal sword and massacred groups like the Waldensians, Albigensians, and Hussites. There's a big difference between an episcopate in the third century opposing Marcion and an episcopate in the 15th burning Jan Hus. Now that's about the Western Church, but my question for my Orthodox friends is what is one to do if one happens to live in Constance in the early 1400s? Do you continue to cling to the necessity of bishops even when they are the very ones starving you of the gospel and potentially burning you at the stake? In such a circumstance, the way to serve the one true church is by returning to apostolic teaching and practice. Now just a few brief comments um, in response to Father Patrick's comments thus far. This will probably have to bleed over into my next uh, rebuttal, so John, you can cut me off. But uh, much of Father Patrick's opening statement I agree with. Salvation is defined as union with God. Um, but, but for the first two thirds or so, I don't see anything that actually establishes the proposition of this debate namely that the Orthodox Church is the only one true church. Many churches have apostolic traditions, or tradition have a, a, the monarchical Episcopal model. They claim apostolic succession. There's all kinds of questions that come up with uh, ecumenical councils, like who decides which ones are ecumenical, what kind of Episcopal bodies can comprise a legitimate ecumenical council. But the main, the main thing is it's irrelevant because there's other non-Orthodox traditions that accept those ecumenical councils. It's irrelevant to the proposition of this debate. The main argument, as I heard it, was two things. There's the maintenance of the apostolic faith and an unbroken line of succession. And I would simply say um, the claim needs to be established that it's the Eastern Orthodox Church exclusively that has maintained the apostolic faith over and against the Oriental Orthodox, for example. And, it's uh, so time, that... but you can finish, finish your sentence. So, Oh, I don't want to go over. <laughs> no, okay. I'll... I'll pick it up. Thank you, though. Sorry for being exact. <laughs> no, no, no. That's your job. All right. Um, great. So now we come into the second uh, rebuttal period, and it's five minutes each. And uh, you, Father Patrick, uh, go first. Right. Now, he raised the point about Oriental Christians. Now, there's two issues here. One, is that since the issue is technical. Well, I don't know what exactly that has a relevance of weight of what meaning. The issues of a tr Trinitarian and a tr of theology are extremely complex and difficult. They're not easy, simplistic um, ideas. And so some of the matters of division are in, in a human standard technical. But this does not mean that that issue isn't real, established and divisive, just as some technical differences in human studies may cause uh, a group to be do something completely wrong um, in, in whatever it's doing. So we can't in itself, the technology is not a way of judging whether something's right or wrong. Now, the Oriental Orthodox so-called were divided from the church because they refused to accept the Council of Chalcedon, that, that, that Christ has two natures, one uh, epistasis and two natures. They refused to lose the language of to natures, and they refuse to accept the combination with the authority appropriate to the bishops of the Escorus, whom they call the saint, who was condemned by the council. So this is why they're cut off. They were cut off from there. And this is quite clear where they are not part of the Orthodox Church. Their claims are not that of the, of the Orthodox Church or, or the church, and they are a separate group. And so, and as I say, this is utterly clear. Um, no, one might want to believe what they believe, that is fine, but it's still not what the Orthodox Church claims to be, therefore they are not Orthodox Christians. Um, the now, the other thing is about the development of presbyters and bishops. Now, there's an interesting theory that they came out because the names seem to be interchangeable, but this is not the case. 
the fact is, is that what we do have, and this is why I've taken St. Ignatius carefully, is that we have a modern understanding of a bishop and presbyters, which we are anachronistically putting back and saying, that's not what we see in the past. But the problem is that some of the modern ideas of the monarchical episcopate are not actually what the, how to understand the episcopate. The, the issue is that there is a synod in each church, the synod of Christ and the apostles established in each place. There is a group and they are all in a sense equal. They're all presbyters or bishops or priests. They are all the same as priests. There is one that is established from among them as the archpriest, the high priest, who is a center of unity. And as such, he has a specific role and as a singular point of ordination, singular point of consecration of altars, and a singular point of consecrating the holy myrrh. This is for the unity of the priesthood in each place. This is what the distinction of Peter is about, to distinguish one among the equals so that there is unity. And this was established from the first. And it's no problem that sometimes we talk about presbyters, sometimes we talk about the bishop in a singular form. These are quite interchangeable. What we can't have is just simply the presbyters on their own without a bishop, because that is not the early tradition of the church. And this is seen utterly clearly throughout all the, from the second century on that there was one singled out. And all the lists of bishops go back, and they be able to name that one who's singled out. And there's no nothing contradictory about this. So these ideas that there's somehow some development in this are simply the products of people who don't actually believe that the structure is necessary to the church. There is no contradiction in any of the early materials that this is the structure that was widespread and that it is the one that carried on um, from there. Now, this is also true that the things of the chief seas Cyprian himself in the third century was clearly the chief see of his region. There were groups and synods of bishops gathered around so that they could ordain other bishops. This was again part of the being of the church. This is apostolic tradition. The church could not continue without the synod to ordain new bishops um, to maintain the church. This is fundamentally core to what the church is. And also the chief sees of Pet Petrine sees were also from the first. And when the Council of Nicaea says Rome, Alexandria, and Antioch, it talks about them as ancient custom. In other words, from the times of the apostles. It does not talk about establishing them something new. And again, this is in the early fourth century and nothing to do with the fifth century. But these things were established clearly from the first century by the apostles. And there's no evidence to suggest otherwise, unless one is trying to interpret it from a framework which denies these things as being part of the being of the church. Um, and we've run out of time. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, Dr. Gavin, it's uh, your five minutes. Okay. Boy, the five minutes goes faster than the seven minutes, doesn't it? I'm going to talk fast here. <laughs> okay. There's so much here, but let's just try to hit the high points. Okay. First, this claim the distinction between Eastern Orthodox and Oriental Orthodox. This is the whole point that needs to be proven. Who, how do we know which is right? Each group, group is saying, we're the true church and they broke off from us. And the other group says, no, 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 we didn't break off from you. You broke off from us. The point is there's no historical basis for privileging one of these claims over the other. You have to measure the doctrine of each church by the first century apostolic deposit. Um, the idea of the monarchical Episcopal church structure developing, I'm sorry, I just need to go back to Clement, the Didache, the shepherd, Polycarp, and the entire New Testament. And there is zero evidence of a bishop over a church in any of those documents. And then we have the eccentricities of Ignatius's view. It can be, a, you know, the claim came up, well, the, all the evidence in the second century later on. Well, that's fine. Of course, once it develops, there's evidence that it's there. From the early second century, other than Ignatius, and any time in the first century, there is zero evidence of a bishop over a local church. And we have clear testimony of the words being used interchangeably. That's a real problem. Now, just quickly, parenthetical thought, archbishops, metropolitan regions, not the same. That's the difference between fifth century and fourth century there. The testimony of Jerome, why should it, the Cyprian's testimony or other testimonies be privileged over the testimony of Jerome? He said, the presbyter is the same as the bishop. Before parties had been raised up in religion by the provocations of Satan, 
the churches were governed by the senate of the presbyters. But as each one sought to appropriate to himself those whom he had baptized instead of leading them to Christ, it was appointed that one of the presbyters elected by his colleagues should be set over all the others and have the chief supervision over the general well-being of the community. Without doubt, it is the duty of the presbyters to bear in mind that by the discipline of the church, they are subordinated to him who has been given over them as their head. But it is fitting that the bishops do not forget that if they are set over the presbyters, it is the result of tradition and not by the fact of a particular institution of the Lord. Um, a few other issues that have come up. Is the filioque of the same rank of heresy as Arianism or Gnosticism or the other issues in the early church? If so, why didn't the Eastern fathers r rise up in rebellion against Jerome, Ambrose, Augustine, Tertullian, Hilary, and say, look at this heresy rising up in the West? Why doesn't John Chrysostom stand up and say, stop reading the Western heretics? They're saying the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son as well. In the seventh century, St. Maximus the Confessor declares that it is wrong to make accusations against the Romans on account of their teaching that the Holy Spirit proceeds also from the Son because they are able to derive uh, this doctrine from the unanimous support of the Latin Fathers and Cyril of Alexandria. Controversy, controversy over the filioque clause at the level of heresy doesn't begin until the eighth and ninth centuries. If the filioque clause is such rank heresy as to divide the true church from the false church, why did it take so long to be denounced as such? Moreover, must the Orthodox now look back and regard all these Western fathers as heretics? Why were they tolerated for so many centuries? This issue is extremely technical. Are we really to think that this is what Christ would want? His church is only the people who are right on that? Uh, I, I beg to differ on that. Um, now, let me just say one other issue that's come up obliquely. How much error can the church fall into? Is the Holy Spirit always going to preside in such a way that succession of office will be guaranteed to be within the parameters of Christ's church? Um, think about Galatians 1.6. Paul says, I'm astonished that so soon you are already departing from the gospel. Okay, uh, already in the first century, churches are departing from the gospel. Think of the witness of the Old Testament. God has given so many promises to the nation of Israel that they will be the light to the Gentile nations. But if there's any lesson to be abstracted from the pages of the Old Testament, it is surely this, that God's people fall into idolatry over and over again. This is the recurrent pattern in the book of Judges, for example. In the book of Kings, even during the reform efforts of Josiah and Hezekiah, the high places remain up, let alone what happens in the bad, with the bad kings. Um, the same claim of this kind of institutional privilege could be made by the Pharisees against the apostles. We sit in the seat of Moses. Who are these upstarts? It could be made by Ahab over and against Elijah. The true church is not marked by these institutional parameters. Those serve a role, but the true church is marked by fidelity to doctrine and piety. Are you finished? Okay, uh, so thank you for that. We move on now to cross-examination and uh, uh, you, Father Patrick, begin uh, 15 minutes. Right. Um, one question we have come, as a uh, point I've raised, is about how do we define a Christian? And I have raised put the point of the um, ecumenical councils. Now, what have you, you are you are sort of, as I said, you're making an assumption about what is a Christian. So how are you defining that term and what measure do you have? And from what source are you taking that? And why are you not taking that which the Orthodox Church uses as a measure? So in other words, why is a, a, someone a Christian and not a Buddhist, for example, or a Christian and not a Muslim, or a Christian and perhaps not a um, Mormon or a Christian and perhaps not a Jehovah's Witness. So can you please define where you would sort of draw the boundary and how that would be done? Okay, that's a fair question and it is, it is complicated and messy, but I would say I don't actually think it's just my side's burden to prove that. I think your side would also need to establish this is why this definition of Christian is correct and then we'd bring those competing claims together and evaluate them. 
Uh, I would say uh, the reason a Christian, uh, you know, someone say a Presbyterian today is a Christian and a Buddhist isn't is because the Presbyterian has been baptized in the name of the Christian God, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And uh, while, yes, we've all got the challenge of the tricky edges, right? Where exactly are the parameters there? Um, it just seems to me to be manifestly the case that we cannot restrict that boundary within solely the Orthodox Church. And there's many reasons I have for that. The main one is just, I, with all of my heart, I cannot accept that the Holy Spirit is only at work within the Orthodox Church in such a way that he works through his church. I look at the lives of saints that I admire, both Catholic and Protestant, and say, I cannot accept that that is not the work of the Holy Spirit in their life. So I think anytime we start to restrict the one true church into one sort of set of institutional parameters, uh, boy, does it pass the common sense test. Uh, I just know too many people. I mean, I, I, I've met people who have come to a Baptist church, heard the gospel, uh, immediately their life has been changed and they went from a depressed alcoholic to a pastor who, who founds orphanages and their life, it, it's a 180. I cannot accept that that's not the work of the Holy Spirit because it seems to bear evidently the fruit of the Holy Spirit. I cannot accept that Richard Wormbrand, who was tortured for 12 years in communist Romania, converting his guards who are torturing him through his prayers and charity for them, that he wasn't a member of the Holy of the church just because he happened to be Lutheran. So uh, I think the, the greatest uh, concern I have about this debate is at a, a common sense level of just observing. Um, obviously, the Holy Spirit is at work in places other than simply within the parameters of the, of the Orthodox Church, though I certainly would say he's at work there as well. Okay, thank you. Now, if on the case of the Holy Spirit working, there are many miracle stories and transformation stories and, and, and lives of great piety among Buddhists. And which way are we to say that these stories that exist among Buddhists about their changes, their great piety, their miracles, etc., are not the Holy Spirit and those amongst those who at least sort of talk of Christ, or just to put it at some level, are. So how would you address that? And how would you distinguish between? Okay, fair question. I would say that Buddhists don't believe in the Holy Spirit and that uh, the criterion of 1 Corinthians 12 is a good one. No one speaking by the Holy Spirit can say Jesus is cursed. Anyone saying Jesus is blessed or is Jesus is Lord is speaking by the Holy Spirit. That which brings honor and praise to Jesus Christ is of the Holy Spirit, uh, that's not happening uh, in a Buddhist context. And you're right to press me on this. It's tricky. I don't claim to have solved this or to know exactly where those parameters are, nor is it incumbent upon me in this debate to prove them. I'm simply suggesting that it's not just the Orthodox Church. I don't have to know exactly where those parameters are outside of that. But I would say that you've got Christians uh, and I would call them Christians, they've been baptized in the Trinity, um, out in other traditions that have enormous foundational creedal core in common with the Orthodox. Catholics, you know, when the Lutherans in the 1570s wrote to Jeremiah II, Ecumenical Patriarch of Constantinople, they listed all their similarities, and it's an enormous body of doctrines. The Trinity, the two natures of Christ, the nature of evil, the saving office of Christ in his death and resurrection, the truth and inspiration of Holy Scripture, the second coming of Christ. You've got this common core foundation of doctrine. They affirmed all seven ecumenical councils. They said, we're not rejecting anything that comes to us from the fathers. They differed on the filioque, they differed on icons, they differed on relics, other things like that. Um, that's an enormous body of common doctrine. And so I don't see that as in any way comparable to say, you know, Buddhists having some kind of positive spiritual experience. And I actually somewhat take offense at the comparison that, you know, because someone isn't within the institutional or canonical bounds of the Orthodox church, that therefore it's kind of like a free for all. You know, obviously there's a kind of um, a broader set of doctrinal criteria for what we call Christendom. That's why we call it Christendom. Okay, my next question is, and this cuts back to what I said earlier, and I think you, Rosa, who sets and how do we define what is that broader sense of common doctrine that is 
defines Christendom. What is that? Who's that body? Who, who determined that? Because uh, the Baptists, Presbyterians, Lutherans, Roman Catholics, all have, and Orthodox, all have various opinions of what that is and who they are and where that boundaries of those doctrines are. Uh, uh, how do you determine what is they they are and and how is that in any way somehow proven as some sort of generic truth uh, uh, that must apply to all Christians by on what standard? Yes, again, very fair question. I understand where you're coming from. I would say that every one of us faces that question, including the Orthodox. In the current schism between Moscow and Constantinople, who de who decides who's right? Who has that right to make that decision? Who's a, who, on whose authority do we make that decision? We've all got to, we, we all, no one has a privileged sixth sense, sixth sense by which we can just immediately know, you know, what the doctrine is that is right. We've got to work hard at that. I would say our ultimate criterion is the Holy Scripture, because that comes to us with its own claim of um, divine backing. Uh, it claims to be God-breathed. Uh, it claims to, you know, be unbreakable. John ten thirty five. The scripture cannot be broken. So that is the safest rubric we have to look at. And then, is there, are there judgment calls that we make along the way? If we look to the Apostles' Creed as a as a standard, uh, are we making a particular judgment? Absolutely. But I don't think those judgment calls are avoidable for any Christian. Uh, why should someone accept orthodoxy, accept Chalcedon, and, and reject the Oriental Orthodox view? They have to make a judgment on what they think is the correct doctrine between those two groups. So I just feel that this uh, need of doctrinal discernment is something that every single Christian will have to uh, face, and I don't think there's any short, easy way around that. Thank you. Now, you, you did mention that somehow we live in a different context in the modern world with whatever Christian bodies are around and their, their various claims as being genuine Christian bodies, and that in the past, something like Arians, etc. And in what way would, as you say for Judge Arian, has been any, would, would, well, First question, just briefly, would you judge that an Aryan was somehow less Christian than would be uh, any Baptist or um, Protestant or Lutheran or Roman Catholic today? Yes, I think that Arianism rises higher on the level of doctrinal weightiness. Uh, if you don't believe Jesus is divine, if you don't believe Jesus is God, that strikes at the very heart of the Christian faith. Um, it, you know, what is the gospel? Well, we start in John 1, 1, we see the word of God has become incarnate for our salvation. Arianism strikes at the heart of that. Now, that does not seem to me to be at the same rank as the filioque because of many reasons. One is the filioque is more technical and particular within the schema of doctrine. It's more focused. Number two, it's, it's extremely difficult. Uh, and number three is it was... Uh, affirmed by many within the church for hundreds and hundreds of years, as I mentioned a moment ago. So it seems to me that uh, in ranking the different importance of different doctrines, uh, Arianism would be very high on that list. And it, it seems to me that what divides contemporary Christians, I will call them, uh, is much lower than that. Thank you. Yes, because I, Arians, obviously, for all other things, apart from that one point where they put Christ as a first creature for some philosophical reason, were in all other ways holding every other doctrine that, that a Christian would hold, and perhaps even more Christian in many ways than some uh, Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons are today. But that's now, in that um, regard, I'm just trying, so I just get my head <laughs> um, back into gear again. Um, sorry, I've sort of lost my train of thought. Um, I'll just think of a new question. <laughs> Give me a moment. Um, the right, um, again, why do you think and on what grounds? do you judge and value your opinion in judging as opposed to the fathers of the Orthodox Church in judging 
that one doctrine is more technical and precise than something else or more important than to salvation than something else uh, uh, what how are you grounding this and on whose authority what authority what basis um are you making uh, this judgment call okay um one one reason would be that you have enormously intelligent people way more intelligent than i i am who uh, are on both sides to great number so in the filioque clause when i read the eastern criticisms i think okay i can see a lot of the appeal when i read thomas aquinas defending it i say i can see a lot of the appeal and these two sides seem to me to be well within the the broader creedal context of classical ancient christianity again the western fathers who affirmed the filioque i mean they wouldn't have called it then that but they affirmed that the, the spirit proceeds from the son they were not anathematized there's zero uh, you know calling of this heresy that i'm aware of until the eighth or ninth century so uh, that's one criterion is looking at the testimony of church history Another would be looking at scripture. How, how do these, so you asked about, you know, how do you know one doctrine is more important than another? Well, again, I don't have a sixth sense on it, but you have to work at it. One criterion could be, uh, what do you see in terms of the weightiness attached to a particular doctrine in Holy Scripture? In the Gospel of John, I believe it's in John chapter eight, Jesus says, if you do not believe that I am, you are dead in your sins. I'm pulling this verse from memory. I might have mis slightly misquoted it, but this is one example of where we see the deity of Jesus. If you're convinced as I am that that ego at me, I am, is a reference to that from Exodus 3, um, where you see, uh, well, it's about as significant as a doctrine could be. If, if I'm hearing Jesus correctly in that verse, then we could go to other passages, you know, where the, the, the doctrinal significance of the deity of Christ over and against the Arians is labored to great effect throughout Holy Scripture. So I think we can, in other words, we can look to church history, we can look to Holy Scripture, and we can see how others have worked through these doctrines, and then we can ask about their logical relation to the gospel. If Jesus were not divine, could he save us from our sins? Well, um, I think a good case can be made that you need a divine savior. So there's all kinds of criteria like that we could look at, not, not to short circuit the process or act as though it's easy or obvious, but there are criteria we can look at to rank these different doctrines, it seems to me. Thank you. Now, just going back to a point, you've set a rule about being baptized in the Trinity. What about those Protestants, particularly Pentecostals, who may be Jesus only Pentecostals, in fact, is in a thumb top of Unitarians, and all those who are baptized just in the simply in the name of Jesus, or probably some modern um, people who might name in the baptism name of a creator, the, the, the Lord, or something, and, and, and the, the life giver, or some gender neutral terms. For, for the Trinity. What do you make of these? Yes, I have thought about this in a, in a pastoral vein before, actually. Um, so I, in general, would make a distinction between those who baptize in the name of Jesus because they are Unitarians and those who baptize in the name of Jesus as a formula and practice, but are, in fact, Trinitarians. And, uh, you know, for in, in other words, if you're a Trinitarian, but you happen to baptize in the name of Jesus, that's just what you say during the baptism, I would, I would put uh, less significance on that. Um, it just seems to me that that would, to say that that is the same would be putting too much emphasis on the actual procedure, as opposed to the intention, the context, the meaning, the theology, and, and just are these people within the creedal boundaries of, say, the first four ecumenical councils? So I would probably distinguish those two cases in that way. Okay, so... so 15 seconds. So, hmm? 15 seconds. 15 seconds. Well, <laughs> thank you very much for your reports. <laughs> okay, uh, so now, uh, Dr. Gavin, it's your turn for the cross examination. 15 minutes. Okay, again, I want to reiterate my thanks, Father Patrick, for this debate, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity. L let me ask some questions about salvation, since that has come up. So it's kind of a weighty topic, but I think it's so important not to avoid it. Um, am I headed for hell? 
that's my first question based on what you've said thus far. All right. Well, based on what I've said so far, um, the, you, you seem to be outside of the Orthodox Church. You, you're not in communion with the Orthodox Church. You don't, I take it you don't really accept the, the fullness of the faith of the Orthodox Church. So on the, those grounds, um, you really judge yourself on the matter whether you're not on a, the, the part of the issues, I'm not answering this directly, is that I don't know what's going on in your heart precisely. Um, and so why I say that is, yes, in an exterior sense, you are, um, in a sense, apart from the church. And so it's not looking good. <laughs> Whether the, what, what happens of a, a, in a sense of um, um, in the future or whatever, I, I can't say you are going to, <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen <laughs> with you and, and your relationship to the church in, in years to come. So all I can say is at this state, if you, if you are choosing not to come into communion with the Orthodox Church because you don't accept something that it teaches or something like that, you don't accept the need for the hierarchical communion with it to be under one of its bishops, etc., then you are putting yourself outside the, the church and in a sense outside Christ, outside salvation. Okay, so, so if I reject orthodoxy to my dying breath, I am not saved. Unless something very interesting happens, yes. <laughs> now, now, with that qualification of unless something very interesting happens, can you point to any pre-20th century instances of that qualification in the Orthodox tradition? Because I'm not aware of anybody who would leave any sort of wiggle room like that. Yeah, I again, I, I'm influenced by modern thinkers. and But I'm not also modern thinkers. There is a sense where um, I'm not... Um, willing to well i can in a sense make a judgment that someone's outside the, the, the church um for example a bishop can excommunicate someone and if someone is excommunicated then they are cut off from the church and if they die in that state they are cut off from outside the state so i, I basically my qualification is um simply in, in a sense that if the orthodox faith is correct and everything as i have understood is presented as it has been as i have received it then yes, there you are. Um, uh, I was opening up the fact that I don't know everything and anything and everything like that. And I'm not going to pretend I know everything and everything and everything. I just simply state on the doctrine as I've received it and expressed it and understand it. Yes, but I, I'm not God. And so I, I'm leaving some space open for my own um, potential ignorance. Though not I, I appreciate the space. I appreciate the space. I, I, what I'm... Uh, of course, I'm asking about is, do, does anybody else leave that space in the Orthodox tradition other than people in the 20th century, Orthodox theologians? Because I, I don't see any Orthodox theologians before the 20th century who'd give any of that space. Do you? Um, not really. That's why I, I, I wouldn't say that it's, it's a tort that there's that space. Um, I not sure whether anybody keeps that open. You might be right. There's maybe a modern phenomenon that to keep that door open. So I, I won't, you know, I can't actually speak on that precisely at that moment. And if there was nothing open and I'm wrong and being open, well, I'll have to correct <laughs> myself. So but what about I, for say, someone like C.S. Lewis? I mean, we take a Christian like C.S. Lewis. Suppose that there's a C.S. Lewis gets to judgment day and he says, you know, Lord, I thought I came to know you in 1931. I thought I was in a, I got baptized. I thought I was in a state of saving uh, relationship with you. Um, and if I understand the orthodox view correctly, as you've espoused it, he would be damned. What would be the reason Jesus would give him for C.S. Lewis not making it to heaven? Right. Now, that, that is a um, good question. A again, it comes down to unity of body and soul. We are humans. We are physical, spiritual creatures. And so, as you've agreed, that, that salvation is union with God. And it has to be affected both physically and spiritually. Now, the physical is, in a sense, a connection with Christ through the baptism, but it's also an interconnection with every other member of the body of the church. And this is real physical reality. This is, has to be instituted for a physical baptism. It is taken for physically eating the body and blood of Christ and being in link with a physical hierarchy, which is a physical laying on of hands interconnecting all the hierarchs. And when you can really see that this is broken, 
because Christ is truly incarnate. He takes a true body. He truly saves us physically. So this union has to be really tangible. It's a real physical thing. It can't be abstracted or spiritualized out of, in a sense. It has to be maintained in a physical sense. So okay, yes, you, you may believe this, the same thing, etc. But unfortunately, you are cut off from the body because you're the church is whatever Anglican church has many years has cut themselves off. Uh, what can we do? You have to, uh, the gospel has to be preached by the preachers. Have to go to, to preach the gospel in all places. It says in Romans. How are they going to pay if the if a preacher does not turn up? And okay, so, thank you. I, I, I yeah. sorry to interrupt. I, I, I hate interrupting, but I, I in the queue. This is the one time in my life I would interrupt. So forgive me. That's right. But sure. I, I have several questions. I would just follow ups if I may. How, in light of the fact that he was not a martyr who dies for his faith, but a criminal who by his own testimony was dying for his crimes, how was the thief on the cross saved? Well, there's a couple of ways we can um, talk about it. Where is one open question? Was he Jew? Was he not? Um, in a sense, um, it was a, the Jews were the church prior to Christ. Now, in a sense, that comes to an end. But there could be some residual on until the resurrection that the Jew is still part of the, the body of Christ in a sense, um, even at the time of crucifixion. So that's one, one way of thinking about it. The other one is that he does die in faith. He dies because he, he's on the cross. It, it maybe initially starts to curse Christ. And then he goes, oh, hold a minute. He recognizes Christ who he is. He recognizes that he dies for um, he's innocent. And he also recognizes that he's not going to die. He's going to rise again. How on earth could he say, remember me in your kingdom, if he's expecting him to just die? Now, what a massive sense of faith in Christ and who he was to think that on the cross while he's dying with him. And he confesses his sins on the cross. So he's confessing the faith of Christ. He's confessing his sins. And he... He dies the same death as Christ. He is truly baptized, by not the, um, the symbol in the water and that, but by taking on the very death that Christ took. And he accepted it as proper to himself. So he wasn't trying to reject it or fight it. So he, and again, he, as I was Christ, he, he gave himself over to it in an acceptance for his, for his sin. So I think there's enough reason in there to say that this was Savitic for him. Okay, thank you. Uh, I want to read a statement from Dositheus, uh, Eastern Orthodox theologian, Patriarch of Jerusalem. This is from his confession, uh, Decree 16, and then I'll just ask for your reaction if you agree with it or not. He said, we believe holy baptism to be of the highest necessity, for without it none is able to be saved, and therefore baptism is necessary even for infants. For those that are not regenerated, since they have not received the, emission, the remission of hereditary sin, are of necessity subject to eternal punishment. Would you agree with the patriarch? I agree with that. I, I agree. With, well, um, I'll qualify it slightly. I agree that baptism is necessary. St. John Chrysostom says that if you have 10,000 virtues, you die un, unbaptized because you're not born again. You, you're still bound to death. And as bound to death, you, you cannot be united to life. Um, so this, this is true. The only qualification I'd have on that is when it talks about punished forever, God judges each person according to their deeds. And so we don't necessarily mean that someone who dies without baptism outside the church is necessarily punished or some sort of degree of, there is a sense maybe of punishment, but we, we've got to be qualified what we think that is because that depends on the person's um, actions and life, et cetera. So an infant would not suffer in the same extent, say Judas would suffer. Um, so I only qualified that in case he's a sort of a, a, an assumption of, <laughs> of the, the worst suffering for the, for the infant um, and not so being baptized. Okay, thank you. Um, here's a question uh, for you as an Eastern Orthodox Christian looking as, as an outsider on the West. So suppose that you know, you're, someone is born into the late medieval West and they are, as a matter of conscience, opposed to indulgences. They feel they, they are conscience bound in opposition to indulgences. And they think that people should have the scriptures in their own language. And they think that people should have communion in both kinds. And they're not, they live in Constance and they saw Jan Hus burned at the stake and they're not, they feel that this was wrong. Um, what are they to do? 
Uh, what should, in your opinion, what should they do? I mean, how, could you expect them to even know? Supposing they don't even know that Eastern Orthodoxy exists because no one's ever told them. What would what would you want for them? What do you think Christ would have them do? Right. Again, this is um, um, a question that's a sort of assuming an individualized sense of salvation. Now, the, the, as I said, the salvation is physical and spiritual, but it's also communal. We are saved with the church, in the body of the church, receiving the church. And it's just part of our human character, our constitution, that we divide in space and time across things. And if the bishops do cut off from the other bishops, you can, and they will take their flock down with them because they are the things that are binding the churches together and the flocks will fall their bishops. That's why the bishops are condemned for their, for, because they need that physical connection. Now, a person at that time, if they knew to seek or try to seek, they could travel across the, the world, but in some ways, there's not much can be done just as in the sense for nations where Paul says are without hope apart from Christ, apart from those who are cut from the Jews, because they separated from Cain, they separated at various times from the, the holy nation, from the ark of salvation, and that is just the human condition, and they spread out all over. There's not much can be done without denying them as human beings that they are born this way, it's a fault of their parents, etc, etc, but this is just a reality of being human and the reality we need that we need to be corporately joined together. Um, yes, it, it's not nice, but this is about what it is to be human and how we are to be saved as human beings. Okay, thank you. Um, here's a scenario I'd be curious for your uh, interpretation of. Let's suppose there's a third world country that suddenly acquires uh, an understanding of the gospel either through the internet or they receive a bible you know this happens actually sometimes where people come into contact without but not through people just through a document or the internet or something like this they come into contact with the gospel suppose in one village and i've heard stories like this where um there's a response to the gospel uh in reading the new testament there are baptisms in the name of the trinity there are professions of faith in christ and the demons in the village are cast out the witch doctors lose their power and actually there's healings, miraculous healings in the village. If such a thing were to happen, would you, well, how would you interpret that? Because I'm, you know, Jesus said, a king, you know, you can't cast out demons by demons. How do you, how would you understand that? Would you, could there be anything that could happen like that outside of orthodoxy that would make you say, that must be the Holy Spirit? Right. This again is why, Christ is through all things. God is through all things. The Holy Spirit is through all things. So when we talk about the Spirit being in the church, we're, we're meaning it in a specific manner as opposed to being his general presence through all, the, all creation, sustaining it, etc. And in the particular issue of a church, he is there as a forming, establishing people as the sons of God in union with We've got that's Jewish rule. It does not mean that outside the church, God does not work. Um, that 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 think miracles don't happen, events don't happen, etc. The, the question is: Is that those miracles in themselves unificating or by uh, uniting with Christ, or establishing this Christ, this, this presence of Christ there? They can be still witnesses to God is real, and that it's affirming the faith. And God with, but they, but doesn't mean that in that that these people are coming into the union of the church, into union with Christ, and having the Spirit as born again sons of God. So I do believe that God can work miracles, etc., outside the boundaries of the church as His general presence through all creation and testify Him to Himself beyond those boundaries. But there's a specific sense which we talk about the Holy Spirit within the church and it's and, it, and identifying and establishing people in Christ in union with Christ, um, which is only to be found within the church. Um, so that would be- Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, that's helpful. I think probably just have time for one last question. It's about apostolic tradition. Irenaeus, I was just reading through against heresies again, he insists that Jesus's post-baptismal ministry lasted between 10 and 20 years. So he died as a middle-aged man, and he attributes that to apostolic tradition, saying, quote, those who were conversant in Asia with John affirmed that he conveyed to them that, that information. Some of them, moreover, saw not only John, but all the, but the other apostles as well, and heard the very same account from them, end quote. 
should we believe that Jesus died as an older man? Or can there be errors in the transmission of apostolic tradition? It's time there, but Father, you can answer that question, of course. <laughs> yeah. If, you, if uh, Dr. Gavin well, agrees. Uh, yep. Yeah. No, I'm happy um, to, yes. Um, my, my take on that would be that while apostolic tradition itself is what is taught by the apostles as inspired by Christ, so it itself is, it can't be contaminated. What can be done is that individuals speaking on the matter may make errors. They may have their own opinions and stuff. Some of these opinions may be such that, that they're contrary to faith. Others may be just minor errors of idea, facts, or something like that. And these are not, because we're humans, there is some scope for um, variation, uh, you know, we, we just inherently have some variation of opinions, et cetera, and ideas. So we just accept that. We don't say everything must be said, must be accepted and reconciled. Some things we just quietly put on the side, like Noah, we cover over and just <laughs> ignore that because it's not the general consensus of the fathers. Um, That's why we talk about the apostolic consensus. So individuals may say the odd thing, which we don't necessarily accept. Now, that doesn't mean that, um, that it falls into heresy. And we're, we're again, back to these other points, yeah, heresy has to be some, it takes sometimes some time and then it's formally defined as, as wrong. And when it hit, rubber hits the road and then it's sort of condemnable to continue that afterwards, even sometimes if it's condemnable before, but there needs to be sort of a, a slightly formal de definition of it as well. Okay. Thank you. If, uh, thank you both for that. Uh, now we move on to closing statements, and uh, uh, Father Patrick, you begin with five minutes closing, closing statements. Right, thank you. Um, again, I'm going to return back to the church. Now, he's, let's focus a bit more on the Orthodox Church. The Orthodox Church claims to be the true church, and, the, and its claim to maintain the apostolic tradition. And this claim is the apostolic tradition as maintained at the first, by the first ecumenical council, at the second ecumenical, third, fourth, sixth, seventh ecumenical council, and onwards. And also its continuing um, apostolic succession. Now, it, other churches refuse to maintain in union with that with the Orthodox Church for one reason or another, such as the Oriental Orthodox split off from the Orthodox Church just because they refuse to accept that Christ has two natures and the language of two natures, particularly sticking to one particular phrase of indeed a great saint, but they stuck to it without the broader context and they refuse to come into communion or to accept a judgment of the church and the escorts. And so they remain separated to this day. Um, the Roman Catholic Church, uh, Orthodox, started to impose an idea of papacy, which was foreign. They, they had all sorts of innovations in practice of um, using um, unleavened bread, changing from leavened bread. And these things are historically verifiable. You can look through historical and yes, they did, and they changed this and that. Now, whether it's justifiable is another matter, but there is a historical clear that there was a change. There was innovation in what was being said and, and done in Roman Catholic. And it got to the extent that it became untenable to continue to remain in union. The issues of something like the filioque, that yes, it was something said in words by Latin fathers, but the question of what they meant, what they meant in context of a, of a dis, dispute that later arose with it, with it, what they would mean in context of it being inserted into the creed um, are, are different matters. And uh, though it was why you can see it in reasonable numbers in the West, um, where it really matters is by the ninth century when the matter is discussed, and then by the um, 12th or 13th of Council of Leon, and then finally at Florence, when it, the, the exact definition of Florence is expressed, which um, wasn't what Mr. Maximus could interpret it to mean or anything like that, he would reject it just as much as anyone else. Um, it had to be formally condemned as heretical that that doctrine claimed by what was claimed to be an ecumenical council was actually heretical and it was formally had to be condemned as such and it has massive effects on the way we understand the church 
and things like that. So, yeah, so I think ICONS basically is the Seventh-day Ecumenical Council, and most Protestants reject icons, the veneration of icons, the drawing icons, painting icons, and kissing them and, and venerating them is not done amongst Protestants. Um, and so they don't teach and hold the same faith. They don't hold the, um, um, the, the council of the Seventh Ecumenical Council. Um, maybe little pockets of them do, but then they'll reject it in other ways, or they reject the priesthood, which um, and, and the canons of the, the church, and therefore you must have a bishop to do this and that. Oh, we, we don't need bishops because we think in the Old New Testament, there's no evidence for the bishops. Well, uh, there is reasons why you don't see that evidence, but they've judged on their own opinion apart from the received tradition and the canons and the rules of the Orthodox Church, and they set themselves up contrary to that. So we can see that they're not Orthodox. And we can see that these things that the Orthodox hold are consistent with the past. Now, one might argue one thing or that I think is development, but you can't prove that there's any inconsistency with what the Orthodox say. You just simply say, I don't think that, that it's well established or whatever, but it's not that the thing is absolutely contradictory to what the Orthodox teach. Um, and so for me, the Orthodox Church is the only one, both in tradition and faith, which has maintained faithful to all the councils, entire history and the scriptures throughout time. And it's the only one to really have a true claim to be the church in the sense of that perfect unity of one mind, one heart, one body. Okay, thank you for that. And uh, Dr. Gavin, it's your uh, last, uh, not uh, last statement, five minutes, closing statements. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, John. And thank you again, Father Patrick. In the 1570s, several Lutheran theologians wrote to Jeremiah II, Ecumenical Patriarch of Constantinople. Their mutual letter correspondence recognized an enormous amount of agreement on topics from the truth and, and inspiration of scripture, the doctrine of God, the Trinity, the two natures of Christ, the nature of evil, the saving office of Christ in his death and resurrection, the second coming of Christ, etc. They also shared many points over and against the Western Roman Catholic Church communion in both kinds, rejection of indulgences, rejection of purgatory. But they disagreed on matters like the filioque, free will, justification, the number of sacraments, invocation of the saints, icons, relics, and other matters. The differences between them are very significant, but they are not comparable to the disagreements in the early church between, say, the Marcionites and the church, or the Gnostics and the church. Their Lutheran theologians shared with the Orthodox, a common creedal foundation. They recognized this when they wrote, quote, although we might differ in some customs because very great geographical distances separate us, we on our own, on our part had hoped that we were in no way innovating on the main articles concerning salvation. Since as far as we know, we held and kept the faith which had been handed down to us by the holy apostles and prophets, by the God-bearing fathers and patriarchs, and by the seven ecumenical councils, that were founded upon the God-given scriptures, end quote. In a similar spirit to these Lutheran divines, let me say that as a Protestant Christian, I seek only to serve and honor the one holy Catholic and apostolic church of Jesus Christ. I would give my life to, to serve this church. What I wholeheartedly reject is the claim that the Orthodox church is the only true church. Such a claim has no basis whatsoever. And I'd like to summarize just a few of the ways we've seen that. First of all, if ecumenical councils are the standard, lots of other Christians accept all seven ecumenical councils. Therefore, the Orthodox Church is not the only true church by that criterion. Is there any other criterion? Well, we've seen there's no historical criterion. Most of Christendom claims the same kind of apostolic succession. Uh, the claim to be the one true church, ultimately, when you press into it, is simply a claim. Uh, one side says, we're the one true church, and you split off from us. The other side says, no, 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 we didn't split off from you. We're the original church and you split off from us. And the only way to adjudicate those claims is by working through the doctrine. Now, what about the doctrine? Icons. Are icons the practice of the early church? Look at Canon 36 of the Synod of Elvira. Look at Tertullian. Look at basically any Christian anywhere before the year 300. I think it's a hard case to make that that's continuity with the earliest church. Is the filioque... Uh, uh, heresy. Again, if so, why was it not recognized as such until the 8th century, when basically the entire West is affirming this, nearly? If that is heresy, why didn't it get called out earlier? 
I think the claim that the Orthodox Church is the one church that's maintained the apostolic doctrine is simply impossible to make. The Episcopate, was the Episcopate a development? I think it's very evident, as is recognized by most academic scholars working on this question, that you, you can't take these statements about, there's so many of them, presbyters presiding over churches, submit to the presbyters. Again, I'll mention the Shepherd of Hermas, First Epistle of Clement, the Didache, where you're still electing your own leaders, uh, Polycarp, the entire New Testament. Um, I, I would say the evidence is abundantly clear and consistent see with the testimony of Jerome that the bishops is an office that develops in the context of the Roman Empire. And um, therefore it lacks your divino. It is not this conditionless perennial feature of the church. We have to get a more thoroughgoing understanding of what the church is. It's not just within one set of institutional boundaries. And there's a basic way that anybody can know that is just by meeting some saints. You know, go out and meet some saints outside of the Orthodox Church and tell me that their lives are not graced by the Holy Spirit in such a way that testifies to his work outside of those ecclesial boundaries. Let me conclude by quoting again from the Lutheran theologians in their letter to Jeremiah. Quote, if the Heavenly Father, in fact, I'll just summarize the quote because I'm almost out of time. They basically say, if God brings us into unity, if God brings Constantinople and Tübingen together in the same faith, they say there is no event that we should desire more. And I would say those of us who share the desire of those Lutheran theologians should continue to talk to each other. Who knows what God might do? And that is why I truly am grateful for this debate. And I reiterate my hope that it both honors Christ and advances truth. Okay, thank you both for that. Uh, it was very interesting to listen to both. And uh, I think the audience will agree. Uh, let me uh, remind everyone for one thing uh, before we move on to the Q&A, and that's to be uh, polite and nice in the discussions. Uh, you can have uh, Dr. Gavin and Father Patrick as examples. They're debating, they're disagreeing, but they are not yelling and, you know, all of that. So please, I want my comment section to be clean from that. Uh, if you're Orthodox and believe the Orthodox Church is the only one to church, uh, if your actions say one thing and your mouth another thing, people will point that out and it will not look good. So that's uh, what I will say. And of course, the same is for the Protestants, but since I am Orthodox, I will, I will not point that out. Okay, um, we will take a quick break and we will be back soon. <laughs> Uh, okay, so we are back. Um, let me also, uh, if you, I have a Patreon account, if you want to support this channel, you can do that. If you don't, it's okay. <laughs> uh, but if you uh, want, you can do that. Uh, everything goes to poor children, uh, mine. <laughs> so, okay, so. We will continue now with uh, the Q&A and I have gathered some questions uh, beforehand, but the most, most of the questions were uh, I was trying to write down uh, as the two guests were speaking. But Father Patrick, you have a question from one from India that is uh, Orthodox and he says this, you have kind of already answered this, but uh, I still think you can uh, uh, I, th I still think we can ask this question. What happens to people like in India who never heard of the church and their whole, li whole idea of the Christian faith is based on the work of schismatics and Protestant groups? In other words, is Christ bound by the sacraments and the historical limitations of the church? Yeah, the answer again is that the church is a divine human body and as a human body it does have some as it's expressed on earth it, it has to conform to what it is to be human and therefore there are limits on its extent etc there are practical limits on it's, where it's how it is expressed or is found um, and, and so in these cases yes it's tragic 
that those in the past, uh, putting their own opinions above that of the unified opinions of the church, decide to split off from the church thinking they know better or forming their own groups, et cetera, and therefore affecting all the ones following them in the, the vision. Now, it doesn't mean it's all hope is lost because there's no reason why, such as when um, we have it in Georgia, uh, and Nina showed her great faith, being isolated almost uh, uh, there from away from the church, that the, the king and queen um, talk, saw her and called on their faith, that they can't then call to the patriarch of Antioch, which they did, and ask the priests to come and to be sent for them. And so there's no reason why someone in India today, with the internet, etc., cannot contact, find on the internet address, find a, a bishop or a priest and say, help, help, we, we, are, we are stuck. And I think there are orthodox missions in India. So today, especially due to the increase of ease of travel, et cetera, this, these issues become far less of a, of a problem. And we do find orthodox growing up everywhere. And I've known orthodox in Indonesia, et cetera, who found the church. Um, it's not easy. Um, and I had to find the church I had to move from about two or three different cities before I could find someone who could speak enough English to, to catechize me. But by the grace of God, it was all possible. So, um, yes, so I think the main part is, yes, the church is a divine human body. And in this age, there are limits the way the church works. You do need to have a preacher turning up at your door, et cetera. Um, but if it wasn't that, then it would not be the church. It would not be able to save humans as humans, and it would be some different thing. It would be a different type of salvation. It would deny humanity being what it is, and I don't see how we can get around that issue. Uh, Dr. Gavin, if you want to, do you want to comment that also? Uh, a quick uh, response. So, uh, yeah, uh, very. I'll be very brief. Um, uh, I appreciate the logical consistency and the historical consistency of Father Patrick's answer. It is uh, refreshing when someone will go with the tradition on it because my observation is sometimes it seems to me that contemporary Orthodox Christians are unaware of the historic Orthodox claim uh, from many saints and, and canonical Orthodox theologians, which is very restrictive. As uh, Father Patrick has mentioned it, I would say uh, I truly hope this response does not uh, give offense to Orthodox viewers. It is not my intention to be mean or nasty, but I would say um, I struggle to understand why there is not more evangelistic and missiological zeal within Orthodox groups if they truly believe that, because the eternal salvation of people is so important. So that's, you know, forgive me if that gives offense. Uh, and I would, obviously it doesn't apply equally to everyone, but as a generalization, okay. Uh, there, there's that. And I would simply say that while I understand the consistency, I think Jesus Christ is sovereign and free to work outside of the bounds that he himself has instituted. And so that's why I would uh, see it a little differently, not to justify that different approach, but just maybe to articulate that here. Okay, thank you. Now, we, we didn't talk about this beforehand, but do you want the questions to be that you can go back and forth many times, or is it enough, you know, uh, the one who gets the question answers and then the other can answer briefly? Is that, what do you, how do you I'm feel? Happy with that. I think if we leave it open that we default to that, but if suddenly we, we get an extra idea on a question, suddenly we want to, to, to leave it open. So, then that will usually go, <laughs> <laughs> I raise my hand and sort of think I like, Gavin wants to do likewise. I think it's all right, Gavin. Like, think... That's fine. That's uh, that sounds just fine. Okay. So the next question then is for you, Dr. Gavin. And uh, um, so could one say that your argument tonight is basically uh, from emotion that that you're uh, that you're saying but what about you know those that didn't hear or what about the other ones and isn't then is that a valid argument when we are seeking the truth in scriptures and history thank you oh, okay thank you for the question if someone were to reduce my argument to that i would protest that they have not carefully listened because i made a number of different appeals with regard to when the monarchical episcopal church structure develops with regard to competing claims of apostolic succession. Um, 
with regard to the nature of the doctrinal significance of the filioque. I mean, you know, lots and lots of people just go back and watch and re-listen to what I've said. So it, it's, it would be a deeply unfair to me, I think, to reduce it to an argument from emotion. However, uh, part of my appeal has been to draw attention to what I regard as an unnecessarily exclusivistic and narrow understanding of salvation. That is the uh, historic Orthodox view to my understanding. I want to make very clear that not all Orthodox theologians say that exactly the same way today. Okay, so if people are reading Callistos Ware and so forth, they're getting a little different picture perhaps. But uh, it's good to know the historic view, especially because part of the appeal of orthodoxy, it seems to me, a very wonderful appeal is changelessness, right? In a good way, we're sticking with the tradition. I admire that, that effort, but I don't think it always, but, but the departure from this more rigorous view, I do think is a change, but, um, but I would just simply say that while, well, to the extent that I've drawn attention to that, I think that's a valid thing to observe. And if we have an emotional reaction to it, we might do well to wonder why. It, the thought of God damning for all eternity a baby because that baby was not baptized by the right church strikes us, some of us, as monstrous. Um, okay, that doesn't necessarily mean that's right, but you'd at least want to ask, why does that strike us as monstrous? So it's certainly a relevant consideration. If you want to comment, uh, Father Patrick, uh, a quick comment, you can do that. Well, yes, it has been on the other side of the debate. I, I, I agree with Gavin. I don't think his answer can be reduced to um, an emotive um, point. He did bring out a number of um, different approaches to the matter. Um, there are, it is one of the issues where uh, a particular way of thinking about reality, church, salvation, etc., um, enhances uh, these sort of arguments as being somehow unjust, etc. Um, and there, and of course, we all don't want anybody to be damned or, or go to hell. I don't think anybody in their right mind wants the others to go to hell. The orthodox position isn't that it's trying to claim, as I said in opening statement, something exclusive because it wants to exclude others and, and be and cut them off. It's claiming exclusivity because it's saying that's what the church is, it's how the church is, and we can't define it any other way without denying what it is and therefore the salvation of anybody. Um, so that is the general principle of the Orthodox Church. This is why even some Orthodox, uh, as I didn't answer the question, are you damned outside? Well, I don't want to start <laughs> making that sort of judgment, even though I, the logic uh, follows that through. And I can say, yes, if you do that, this is the logic of it. I, I, I loathe to make it because I don't want anyone to be, to be damned. So, yeah, but I, I think it, it, one needs, it can be caught in an emotional matter on these things, can see it as what they define as right, just, et cetera, and not really think about it theologically about what is right and just, who God really is. What does it mean he's one pure, holy? Um, what does it mean that he's no division, no separation? What does it mean to be saved in body and in soul? What does it mean to true unity with each other? I think these things need to go through at a, a much deeper level than just simply, oh, a baby's going to hell, oh, this is impossible. So yeah, uh, I think that it's easy to do that once you step outside a deeper theological understanding of things. Okay, uh, so maybe the responses can be a little shorter than, uh, <laughs> so we can <laughs> get through many questions. Thank you. Uh, now, Father Patrick, uh, there is a question here for you. In Mark 9, uh, 38 to 39, we read, Now John answered him, saying, Teacher, we saw someone who does not follow us casting out demons in your name. And we, we forbade him, the apostles forbade him, uh, because he does not follow us. But, Je but Jesus said, Do not forbid him, for no one who works a miracle in my name can soon afterwards speak evil of me. So, Father, uh, could this be applied also to the Protestants from your perspective? Yeah, I, I think there is a way that that can be applied. I mean, he says a sort of a contrary statement, otherwise he doesn't give with me scatters. Um, and each of these needs to be understood in its proper context. And certainly, um, I don't think an orthodox necessarily run around saying, Protestants, stop! <laughs> 
<laughs> doing this and stop doing that and, and stop doing that or, or that the Protestant is that is suddenly going to speak evil of, of Christ. No, um, we, we do not do that. We're not denying that miracles can happen outside the church. What we're denying is that the union with Christ and the, the presence of the Holy Spirit in that union and establishing sons of God in Christ is possible outside of the church because that is the defining what the church is. Um, or apart from the mysteries. So that's what we're arguing. So um, yeah, we could apply that to those outside the, the, the um, communion boundary of a church for want of a better word. I would want to state my appreciation for this very perceptive question. And I would want to associate it with the scenario I envisioned earlier about demons being driven out of a village when they encounter the gospel. And I would want to underscore the absoluteness of our Savior's claim. Whoever's not against us is not just in some weird, vague, intermediate state. Whoever's not against us is for us. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I just, I, I think that's a well-framed question. Okay, so uh, Dr. Gavin, uh, um, um, yes. Let I have many questions here. So let's ask, um, you mentioned about uh, there is no mention in the scripture of, you know, uh, there is also a council of uh, presbyters or priests or uh, when it's, uh, I don't know exactly how you frame it. Maybe you want to quickly say it so I can ask the question more correctly if you want. Okay, sure. I think what you might be referring to is my remark that there's no single bishop over a church in the New Testament. Okay, thank right? you. So, um, so maybe one question then is how you interpret, let's see, yeah, in the Revelation, in the book of the Revelation, in chapter 2, 3, and so forth, mm -hmm. it says that Saint uh, John, he says, he writes to the angel of the church, to the angel of the church. Um, now, there is a Orthodox in tradition of, you know, at the altar, there is al always an angel. But another interpretation that I've seen is that it refers to the bishop of the church. Uh, so is, what, could that be an uh, instance where actually there is uh, one bishop in the church and he receives the letter? Yeah. If one held the view that the angelos of Revelation 2 and 3 is a bishop, then that would be support. I think that's a difficult case to make. Um, the word, it would be a very weird, odd word choice, I think, uh, messenger, you know, and it'd be odd that you don't ever have them doing any bishop-like things. Uh, they, they, I think the, the most common view is that they're angels, and then there's a couple of other options as well. So, yeah, that could produce good proof if you could make a case for that. Uh, to my mind, that's a difficult case to make. Father Patrick, if you want... Yeah, um, I I wouldn't make that as, as a particular, I, I, I can accept that I've uh, been on North Oaks, <laughs> I accept that interpretation that it can be a bishop, but I don't think it, it in itself establishes um, to a proof argument that there is a, a, a single bishop in every every church. It, it can be supportive of it, but it's not proof as such of the case. So maybe I can ask one more question then about that, why I came, uh, uh, why I thought of that, because Paul in another place, he speaks about, you know, women wailing, uh, putting a veil, um, how do you say it, veil, oh. and he says for the angels. So I was thinking maybe he speaks about the leaders and, and the connection between the white robes and the angel, like uh, if, if you want to, make a comment about that both and we can move on to the next question i must apologize i don't, didn't quite catch the chain of thought there with the woman <laughs> the veil was it oh, yes I'll, I'll, i suppose I'll, let me answer first and then you might have to... thank you buy no, me I, some I, time yeah I, I i actually find it it's an interesting way again i i um connection that you are linking the angels with the hierarchy of the church um, and so making a connection and therefore the symbol of obedience um, of the woman in respect to the angels is, is, is a respect to the hierarchy of the church is to show that um, she is under obedience to the church um, as 
as such, um, and that structure there. So it's an interesting interpretation. Again, I don't think it necessarily means that they're not the angels, but I can't I say that it's wrong, and it's an interesting and, and feasible explanation. That's, um, but it's not something which I would, again, say proves anything about the connection. But yeah, no, it's an interesting observation. So, Dr. Gavin, do you want me to explain more what I, what I meant? Maybe you should, because I'd hate yes, to give an answer yes, that was off. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so there is a passage, I, I have not written this down, where Paul says, the, I think it's connection with the veil, that uh, women should have a veil, etc., etc., and so it says, for the sake of the angels. And everyone is like freaking out, what does that mean? And maybe simply says, you know, so that the... The, those doing the preaching you know don't get tempted or something like that you know uh, if you know so i'm making this connection maybe the angel in some senses can mean for example the bishops and also in the sense that uh, the angels are often pr pr uh, portrayed as wearing white clothes and the, the presbyters also in the revelation are um, portrayed as wearing white clothes and yeah, but but you know it's it's a connection I have made. If you want to comment or not, it's okay. Thank you. Uh, just briefly, I think I would say I I I'm still not 100 percent sure of the women. If you maybe you're thinking of First Corinthians 11 and the instruction about head coverings there. Okay. Yeah. So um, I think I would just want to articulate a bit of pushback in the sense of let's not put too much weight on these unclear passages. It feels a bit of a stretch to me. Um, because of what, I mean, even if you thought that the angels are bishops in 1 Corinthians 11, it's still not anything clear about a one bishop over the church. I, I think, you know, sometimes there's this feeling of if we're looking, if we're on the hunt for evidence, we might find it here or there, but then you have to step back and say, but is it really compelling? Is it necessary? Are we, is it a stretch? Are we pulling the evidence and the evidential burden together arbitrarily? I, I don't think it's very compelling or clear. I just, I'd say, let's go with the passages where it's really clear. We get like a list of adjectives of what the bishop should be like, you know, or, 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 or a series of instructions about how presbyters should deal with this particular case or thing. You know, we have a lot of that. So I guess I just want to put the focus on the clear evidence from my vantage point. Okay. Thank you. Uh, who is now it's Father Patrick's time, I think. Yes. Um, so Father Patrick, this is a question from a um, follower of my channel, I think, or Facebook, I don't remember. Do you think uh, the reformers were correct to protest the Roman Catholic Church based on indulgences and etc.? Was their divergence an inevitable consequence of bad theology? that had grown in Catholicism since their uh, divergence from orthodoxy? Uh, yeah, actually, in this case, I am, um, I do think that the reformers have a point. I think that the thinking in, in the Roman Catholic churches did start to come out with a, in a sense, a different way of thinking about salvation, a different way of thinking about theology, a different way of thinking about things where suddenly there's merits and you know, the, the, a lot of these terms are used earlier, but just the way that they're approaching it, that the paradigm of thinking had shifted. And so in this paradigm shift, why we're using many things that are said before, there are certain developments, certain um, corollaries of the logic they're following, which start going off in weird and wonderful tangents. Um, and so and that these tangents happen tends to show that they've actually sort of lost touch with the, what we call the, the mind of the church or the, 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 the correct paradigm of understanding salvation. Um, so yes, I think that the reformers um, properly picked up this, something's gone wrong, but I don't think they necessarily managed to shift back into the correct paradigm, which is a much harder thing to do. You just sort of recognize there's a problem, but it's another thing to actually get your mind in the right paradigm. I, I think they came up with another paradigm, which was equally unhelpful. <laughs> may, I, may I comment on that briefly, John? Yeah. Is that okay? Yes, of course. Uh, 
Thank you. Uh, yeah, I appreciate this question. It somewhat relates to one of the questions I brought up earlier about, you know, what should one do if one lives in Constance in the 14 teens, like 14, 16, 14, 17, that kind of thing, right after Jan Hus was burned at the stake, which is my intent with that question is not so much about salvation, but just, you know, what does one do ecclesially, you know, okay, you're outside of the one true church. Can you be less out? can you at least be in less error <laughs> you know can you can you should you protest some of these things and uh you know I, I my interpretation is that the protestant reformation recovered some things that are very good an emphasis upon the free grace of god in christ for example an emphasis a protection of the laity an elevation of the laity uh the notion of the priesthood of all believers in terms of how that played out as a foil to the hard distinction between clergy and laity that had developed in the West. So again, you've got laity stuck in spiritual ignorance. So there's lots of other things too, but I would also want to say the Protestant Reformation was not perfect. It didn't get everything right. It's not as though this is the dream. This is the ideal. It was a very imperfect, but good effort, in my opinion. That would be my interpretation of it. Thank you. So uh, Dr. Gavin, then, um, one other question um, relating, uh, related to the topic of baptism. So every Christian dom denomination or, um, has a view of what is necessary from baptism. Uh, I'm sorry, for salvation. It could be faith, whatever. Uh, and when you have a, you know, when you have a... Um, uh, a criteria there is al always one falling outside so could do you don't you have the same uh, problem let's say like father patrick have with infants because if the criteria is faith obviously infants don't have faith so our infants uh, are not infants um, condemned then in your view and if they are not what happened with the criteria of faith thank you Okay, thank you. Yes. My criteria is actually not faith. I would say faith is the normal way it happens. Faith and repentance. Uh, so I like to say faith and repentance to ward off the caricature that faith is a merely notional assent, which is not what Protestants have historically meant by faith alone. So I say faith and repentance. Faith and repentance are two sides of one coin of how one enters into a reconciled state with respect to the creator God. Um, and I wouldn't say that that's absolutely strictly universal. So I didn't, I wouldn't say it like Baptist. So in other words, it's not analogous. It's not like the, an Orthodox Christian is saying, you have to have baptism. And I'm saying you have to have faith. Rather, I'd say you normally have to have faith, but I absolutely affirm there are exceptions. And I would, uh, I, I've done some videos on my YouTube channel. People could look up Truth Unites for them. Uh, the one on baptism most recently where I address this and I um, make the argument that we have good reason I don't really actually make a lengthy argument for it. It comes up obliquely, but to not go on too long here, I, I, I do affirm that we have good reason to be hopeful in the case of all deceased infants, uh, baptized or not. That's my view uh, for a variety of considerations. One would be David's expression of hope, it seems to me, with respect to his deceased infant, and there's other considerations that come in as well. So it's not analogous. I don't say, I don't elevate faith as, a, as an alternative parallel to baptism. Father well, Patrick, if you have a comment, you can say it. Um, yeah, it's, it's a sort of a tricky one. Um, I, it's sort of hard to, I, <laughs> Orthodox, again, yeah, it's faith and baptism are, are, are combined. We baptize in faith. You're, you're martyred in faith. You're not martyred simply for, uh, if, you, if you affirm a heresy, for example, and you die for heresy, that's not martyrdom. Martyrdom has to be in faith. So when we talk about faith, we're talking about acknowledgement of the, the faith, the, the creed, the, the, the belief of the church. Um, and yeah, well, we can say, infants are saved through the baptism because the, we can talk about most infants will grow up following their parents until about the age of 11, 12. That's pretty obvious when you look at sort of the growth of young human beings, they, they follow their parents. And so if you've got, they are baptized in the context of their parents having faith and a godparent looking after faith, you can know that that, that effect of our baptized in the faith and will grow in that faith. So that means that they may choose to walk away when they're older, but nevertheless, 
they are going to grow in, in the context of faith. So a baptism is not disconnected from faith. And I do think it is an interesting critique of the Protestant position is how do does one, and I'd love to see Gavin's response, but we haven't got time for it now, of, of justifying that a baby who cannot express faith, has no faith, um, is saved because then the, the criteria would have to be and, and if it's not by baptism per se, whether he's talking about you can be alternative baptism um, as, as a solution, or um, but I think he would affirm that even without either baptism or if it's in own faith, it'd still be saved for some reason. Then I, I'm starting to think, well, where does that go? That, that means it's based on their individual actions, their, their individual holiness, their individual innocence. Um, and that starts asking questions about where, how we talk about faith, how we talk about uh, other matters of, of salvation. Um, therefore, would that also be true for Buddhist children, Hindu children, atheists, and et cetera? And therefore, should we kill everybody when they're newly born so that they all go to heaven? There's also some weird questions that can be asked. And that, I think that is an interesting critique, but uh, it's uh, all I can say on that. <laughs> I'm not going to prove a point of it. Sorry for laughing for that. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. Do you want? There was some questions there, so I guess uh, if you want to answer, you can do that. Okay, thank you. Uh, you know, I, I would just say the basis of my position is God is just, God is kind and good. If the gospel teaches us anything, it is that. Also, God is sovereign and free in the distribution of His mercy. It's not as though faith is how we earn God's mercy. It's not as though God says, oh, you got to have enough faith. Faith is simply the reception of that. And so because, so of course there can be exceptions to that. Also for those who suffer from some sort of mental disability, God is good to such persons and um, he treats them according to his goodness. And I, I, you know, questions of why not kill everyone? I mean, we, we kind of smirk at that because, but there's lots of answers to that. One is of course that would be unethical. Another is we don't know for sure. But the, um, the basic idea here is I think this is a hope that is reasonable, but I don't teach it as a dogmatic teaching. I'm not sure. I don't know. God's going to do what God's going to do. All I leave room for is that there is a reason to be hopeful based upon the character of God as it is revealed to us in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And um, I'd say that for, you know, God, God, part of goodness is you treat people based upon who they are. And an infant is not capable of articulating faith. So uh, God is perfectly, if God should choose to apply the merits of Jesus Christ to that infant, who could say he can't do that? And why, who, how could any of us suggest that he's bound such that he could not? I, I just, if you don't mind, I just add on. I think yeah. we're actually a lot of agreement on those points. I think it, um, regarding the whatever happens to the infant god is just he judges infant on what he does and we're both on the same point that that faith is not an action which you earn your salvation because of faith it's an issue of a willingness to accept what god has given you um it's it's a it's a sort of a statement of belief um where the human consents to the reality of who God is. Now, that consent is in the context of the state of the human ability to accept that. So someone um, with um, mental handicap or something of that nature or an infant, they are only required to receive as as they can. Um, as, I, as I think the Orthodox Church will talk about the necessity of baptism, but that applies to everybody, including influence. So we're not raising just a faith issue. But um, yeah, I, I just want to point out that I think in those points is, is quite a lot of um, commonality in the way we're thinking. So. Okay, uh, so Father Patrick, one uh, question that uh, many have, have is when today, you know, the ecumenical patriarchate, the, I think the Russian church, and I'm, I think many other uh, churches, uh, Orthodox churches, patriarchate recognizes that if you're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it's a valid baptism. Uh, now, many don't agree with that, but it's like the general... Uh, uh, view from from the top, let's say. 
So how does that, uh, what do you think? Yeah, what do you think of that? And how does it line with uh, what you have said tonight? Right, it, well, it depends what we mean by valid baptism. Um, there's two ways we can think about that. We can think about that the baptism regenerated somebody as a son of God and brought them and clothed them in Christ and brought them into union with Christ. Um, or we can talk about the verbality of the form of baptism, whether that the form was in the name of a, a triple immersion, a triple application of water in the name of a father, son and Holy Spirit, the right formula, the right ritual um, of the, the baptism. So what I understand to be, and, and the history of a church is clear that the church can accept that the ritual having been done by those outside the, the hierarchical communion of the church can be received without repetition. In other words, they may receive it as a sort of a valid form of um, baptism and they don't repeat it. And so I, I take or interpret in any sense that when they're talking about the validity of baptism outside, they're meaning that the form is a valid form in these other communions as opposed to being regenerative. Now, some might be taking it to mean regenerative outside. Um, that's a different matter, but I, I can in, in interpret it and uh, prefer to interpret it as just simply a statement that, the, that there is some valid um, ritual form of the baptism. Um, in these other communions. I would make a more general remark on this topic uh, regarding, say, I think it came up the, uh, you know, schism between Constantinople and Moscow. Um, uh, the position has been advanced in this debate that there's different kinds of schism. Uh, some are more mild and within the church, others are more severe. I would certainly agree with that. That's part of my case today. Um, but I have to express my lack of awareness that that is the historic Orthodox view. Maybe the, I mean, my knowledge is not encyclopedic. Maybe there's something I'm not aware of. But when I read the old Orthodox theologians on the unity of the church, uh, I've just been pouring through a lot of the literature this past week and a half. Uh, they seem to speak rather absolutely about the unity of the church. Uh, I mean, just pushing the pedal down to the floor with respect to there can be no schism any more than there can be disunity in the body of Christ. So I guess I would just register a concern there with respect to is this distinction of different kinds of schism uh, authentic to the, tradi the orthodox tradition. And uh, to my mind, the, the, what, what the division between uh, Moscow and Constantinople is a real problem because it sort of undermines the, the, the appeal of unity and um, you know, how do you know you're really a part of the church when there's a division? It, it to my mind, somewhat undermines that appeal. Okay, uh, so Father Gavin, uh, yes, so we can move on uh, on the same lines here. Uh, what the view you articulated here today? Do you think it's it's a it's present? Let's say in the first millennia, are the councils church father? fathers that you can point us to that express i don't know if you subscribe to the branch theory but i think it was basically what you are uh, arguing for and if i'm wrong please correct me so are there any church fathers or councils or uh, yeah you can use whatever evidence you want uh, that uh, teaches actually teaches this in the first millennia Okay, fair question. Uh, I, I would not label my view the branch theory. That's a more particular expression of the more general principles in my view, which I would leave more open as, as just the affirmation that the one true church is fragmented. Sadly, tragically, the one true church is fragmented. Uh, she does not exist and cohere only within one set of institutional bounds. Um, church father support. Well, People could go back and listen to some of the appeals that I made. The biggest one is that, of course, there's a different context in the first millennium because you didn't have a split like the split of 1054 at that time. The split of 1054, as I mentioned, seems to me to be more institutional uh, and local originally. And then it sort of spreads. And 
Um, I don't think there's anything quite like that the church fathers are addressing. Now, we could ask, what are the principles in the father's thought? And I tried to draw some of that out by saying, number one, there's development in the way the episcopate is functioning. And number two, there's the articulation of why the episcopate is there. Uh, Gregory Nazianzus, Ambrose, and Augustine were the three that I quoted in my opening speech to the effect that they're, they're, the bishops are serving a larger end that is the real determiner of the true church. So those principles are relevant to that question. But it seems to me that we're simply living, and then of course I, you know, there's on other particular points I drew from the fathers, you think of Jerome for my point about the development of the three offices and that kind of thing. But um, the, the main thing to say is, you know, we're, we're simply facing a different world. It's, it's kind of like asking, are there any church fathers who deny the importance of the emperor? It's like, well, there, you got some church fathers who say he's the guardian of the unity of the priesthood, but you don't really have anyone denying it because that's the world they live in. I mean, there's a scene in the book, my favorite book, uh, That Hideous Strength, where Merlin is transported through time travel to the mo to modern England, and C.S. Lewis describes his inability to countenance a world without the emperor. And he just can't, it's, it, and it says it was as if, he, you know, oh, it was as if you have a world without the sun rising. So um, I, I think we have to appreciate the context in which the early church is developing. Um, but I do think the principles are favorable to the idea that, as well as the historical data about the development of the early church government, are favorable to the idea that this particular institution is not necessary to the church. Um, my take on that is that my issue with the position that Gavin's supporting is that Though we can find fragments of information, you can find a father who says this, a father who says that, a bit of that, we can interpret the scriptures to mean this and that, that it's not a consistent universal sense of, of, um, of what happens. There's not the, the, the general consensus. And the Orthodox would say, look, what we hold, you can go back through all the centuries and you can see it widespread held. Yeah, yes, individuals may say something different here and there, but the, the position which we hold, you can see amongst, uh, well, pretty generally across many bishops, many places um, throughout all the centuries. And it's not inconsistent with any of the material that has gone before. And so there's a much greater sense of wholeness and consistency. Um, and I do find in modern times, many people, when they're sort of arguing for one, and, oh, let's change this or that, because I can see evidence here and here and find fragments of information. Oh, I, I see a spot here, a spot here. Therefore, I can justify my opinion. And I think, well, no, no, no the Orthodox Church is a rule um, era, um, St. Vincent of Erin's is much closer to this. You've got to establish it as a general opinion through all time and places to say, this is the Orthodox way of doing things. This is the true way of doing this is the apostolic way, because I can see it generation after generation of place after place, this is the way they've done it. Um, the, the, this wealth of over historical evidence is in support of it, um, as opposed to, oh, someone says that, and, I, and framing a little story on fragments. And so this is my one of my critiques of, 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 of Protestant, is that they, their position is a little bit based on fragmentary rather than a whole, wow, look, you just look at history. This is, okay, yes, is oddities and variations and exceptions but but it is a general pattern you can see it quite clearly through history so that's my sort of take on <laughs> could i just respond very of course to that? Yeah, thank yeah. you i think father patrick has raised a very valid concern father uh, protestants often do cherry pick and of course anyone can do that just pick here and there and that's true that that's not I just want to say first, I think the principle that the episcopate is penultimate and serving a larger end is not just, I wouldn't say it's consensus because that's too strong, but I would say it's pretty, it's a lot. There's a lot out there to that effect. So I wouldn't say that that's just cure there. And secondly, I'd want to say, I don't want to, I just want to register my disagreement that I don't think the Orthodox view is the consensus. I mentioned the filioque widely attested that the spirit proceeds from the sun as well throughout the early West and Cyril of Alexandria in the East. So I just would want to register my concern that I don't agree that there is that sort of consensus. Father Patrick, maybe that can be the next question. How do you answer to the question that the Filioque or maybe some other uh, 
theological opinions or uh, how you wherever you how you frame it they were present for many many years and there is uh, the argument is there is no combat so how, how can it be uh, such a big thing now and it deserves a schism and if you believe it you're not saved but you know uh, for hundreds of years people did believe it and no one seems to object how do you answer that well there's, there's multiple levels of things what exactly though they, you might, someone might say proceeds from the father and the son there's a question of exactly what they mean by saying that so there's a whole debate about what a particular father says that so so you can see that that it is an expression used in certain writings. It's a whole different game about saying what it means. And so, especially by the time you get to Florence, um, it, it is taken to mean that some specific thing theologically. And at that stage, what is taken to mean at the Council of Florence, what it defines as meaning is something considered heretical in the, um, in the East. Now, even prior to that, there's the, also the other issue of it being added into the creed unilaterally by some churches in the, in the West. Now, if it was just, again, an opinion of some of the fathers in the writings, that's one thing, but when it's inserted in the creed, and this wasn't really noticed by Eastern churches because they simply didn't meet the creed because they had no need to until the missions started clashing in um, the Balkans in the ninth century. And when suddenly it became an issue. But even you can see with Maximus is to, um, thing that when they did meet it even prior to that there were questions being raised um, but it was not until it sort of became part of the creed that a, a statement of the faith of the church where the, the, where the issue really comes to the forefront and then it starts getting disputed um, and there may have taken a while before it sort of settles into something which is officially condemned um, and we don't necessarily, when we have immediately a moment, someone says it, that they're a heretic. No, it, it can take time of argument, dispute, and things like that. And so the way I would say that is, yes, there are different customs, et cetera, which are in the West, which come from very early. But you can see they're just specific to the West. They're not uh, across all the churches and all places. So when I'm talking about universal, I'm not saying everyone has to really have to agree with everything everywhere at all. Sometimes I'm just saying is that, you, if it's a disagreement, you, you can see it's only really found here. It's not found across all the fathers and all the churches. It, it's unique to a region, a place. Um, and whether or not the other churches react to it, I don't know. I can't judge for that. But I, there are cases like when it's added to the creed, when it's been clash of missions, and when it's been interpreted in the later days to mean something else, which may not have been how the early fathers were using it. They might have been something different then um, it can become a problem, even if it is said. So it's not just simply the fact that saying it is what you mean by it, which is part of the, the, the context of the argument. Briefly, uh, it seems to me that the, the historical record is not so vague. Um, I mean, it, it, you know, the simple language of the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son Okay, that is stated many times in many places by Western fathers and by Cyril. Um, this generosity of saying, well, what do they mean by that? No one's extending that generosity after the ninth century. So I think that this claim, and you have Maximus saying very clearly, don't judge the Romans for the filioque. Don't judge the Romans for that, for they have a consensus. So, and that's in the seventh century. So I don't, I, I would just register again my discomfort with this idea that the orthodox view on this is sort of a patristic consensus. I, I, I just don't see it. All right. Uh, how long about, uh, do you want to continue? Do you want to continue for 15 minutes, 10 minutes, five minutes? Uh, uh... Probably no more than about 20. <laughs> okay. uh, I, I, Perhaps I, on I, the shorter I... side. Yes. Yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm sort of getting a bit tired now. So yes, um, yes, yeah. All right. So let's do like two more questions, and uh, um, I think it's for you, Dr. Gavin. I want to ask you about um, in Galatians. You me you mentioned Galatians. So in Galatians five twenty to twenty one, it says that those creating heresies 
and in though in that time it means really sects so it's not simply you're having another opinion but you're actually go you know going outside the main body and creating a sect uh, will not inherit the kingdom of god it says would then this mean that creating denominations is condemned in the bible ah uh, okay uh, i've just got the verse open here yeah this is the of course the list of the works of the flesh yes 520 21 yes and the word schismata is used here for for dissensions or divisions. I believe it's it's translated. Uh, heresies, I think. Well, that that may be your translation. My, my translation here, I'm using the English Standard Version, has divisions. Uh, this is one of two occurrences of the Greek word schismata in the New Testament. The other I referenced earlier in 1 Corinthians 11. Uh, to my knowledge, I don't think there's a third. Uh, I might be wrong. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this passage is simply talking about saying those who do evil, these evil practices are, uh, don't inherit the kingdom of God, which I don't really see as a problem for the Protestant. The case would need to be made that denominations are schismata. And I would say that that's really actually a difficult case to make. I mean, um, denominations are just what you get when you have a separation between the church and the state, and then you're trying to do theological triage and follow your conscience on your convictions, even while you recognize another church may be a part of the one true church. To be a Protestant allows you to have a more generous posture toward other Christians, it seems to me, because you can recognize that even amidst institutional differences, there's another church. My church partners together with about six of the churches in our valley, and we do a worship service together once a year on Good Friday. That's an example of where we can recognize we are brothers and sisters in Christ, even though we are not part of the same church. So no, I don't. I think it'd be a, 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 a difficult stretch to stretch from schismata as a work of the flesh to denominations. And I, so I have the, um, just to be clear, I have the no, uh, Novum Testament, the Grazia, and the 28. And it says in uh, the verse 20, it says eresis, but I'm looking here and there is a variant there, uh, eris. And, but this reading, heresis, then it's from Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, all the old, uh, oldest uh, manuscripts. So, so it seems um, if you want to, you already gave your answer, but uh, I think it's... Uh, yeah. That's fine. I mean, uh, I, I'm not really sure I'm following the point. Um, heresies and schisms are, I, I don't, I'm not, I don't. Yeah, recall. the point, uh, yeah, the question is uh, because I am asking this because I, uh, I have done another interview where a person actually became orthodox on this verse that uh, Paul condemns people going outside the body creating a sect. And I don't think sect has the bad connotation it has today, you know, of crazy people, but simply um, going outside uh, the main, let's say, church body. Uh, so what's your view of uh, that question? There? Okay, well, again, whatever, whatever label, whatever English translation we use, the Greek word is used in one other passage in the New Testament. Right, so it'd be very helpful to cross-reference and under better understand its usage here by seeing its usage in First Corinthians eleven eighteen. There, Paul refers to schismata in the church in Corinth, and it does not mean, you know, leaving the one true church, because these different schisms are all part of the church of Corinth. So I would argue that um, schisms there are. This supports my case. There are different kinds of schisms. All schisms are sin but they are of different ranks. Not all of them are such that make you not a part of the one true church, such as happens with 1 Corinthians 11. Right. Um, yeah, for an orthodox take on that, um, I think that this comes down to Gavin's sense of what is the communion of the churches and how close that is. So uh, when you have it in the orthodox sense, it is that the bishops and there are all those churches that are united together, and you're, and it's an important part of the orthodox faith. You must stay within the communion of a hierarchy. You must the bishop must presbyter must stay with his bishop. The bishop must stay with his metropolitan. Metropolitans must stay with their patriarchs, and continue the unity, the sort of physical bonded unity of the of the hierarchy of the church. 
And therefore, heresies and stuff are those things which, if you go and set yourself out for whatever reason that is, whether it's schismatic or heresy, you are cutting yourself from the unity of a church. Um, and that is really bad. Um, and in some ways, the Orthodox critiques will let the Protestants almost deny this sort of body, in a sense, um, as unity of a body. And almost by definition, in some ways, they ask each one is going, my opinion is we do it like this. My opinion is we do it like this. We might, and they're all ah, just uh, separate opinions, separate heresies of um, defining what they think is the church, I think. And they split themselves into separate communions in, in so doing. And, and for one author, I thought, well, that's just an absolute clarity that they, they have lost all sense what the church is. Um, but of course, the government wouldn't understand because he's coming from a different paradigm. But you can see from the orthodox paradigm that this, uh, yeah, this has a lot more punch to it in a sense. All right. So I have some questions that this for both of you. And one is the classic, you know, what's, uh, what's the strongest and weakest argument you think of your uh, opponent? today tonight in this debate and uh, you know why do you agree and don't agree so uh, i don't know father patrick maybe you can start could, sorry could you just remind me say that yes again. what's what's uh, from this debate what's uh, father gavin's uh, gavin uh, strongest argument and weakest argument in your opinion and why don't you you know why don't you become baptist or protestant why why why, why are you not uh, persuaded? Um, I think, oh. Sorry. No, it's right. The, the strongest argument from um, Dr. Gavin puts across um, is that we can find exceptional opinions and stuff among the fathers. Um, and so like Jerome, his opinion and suddenly that sort of undermines the sort of uniformity of a case or that um, issues such as the expression of seeds from the father and the son is found commonly in the west but not probably as commonly as I, I'd say he makes out but I, but nevertheless it's still I agree it's a and this tends to undermine a sort of sense of everybody saying the same thing and stuff and if it doesn't why why there's no reaction to that um, so and there are cases too of, as he talks about the villages and what happens in there, um, it, it raises a serious and interesting challenge to the sense of the Holy Spirit being in the church. I think it's, it's a legitimate and valid point. Um, though in, in the point where I would, would not be accepted that, as though, though he may find my, some of my solutions to that to seem to be a little bit weak. Um, I find that the general consistency of a theological opinion, the sense of union, the sense of what theosis is, the salvation is, I became Protestant uh, Orthodox because what, how do we find what a Christian is? And it's because of the creed and uh, that you have a definite sense of the councils, et cetera, and uh, that, and who's decided that, well, that was a testimony of the churches, well, who are the churches, that, those are the bishops, et cetera, coming together through, through history. So you come part of that organization. Um, and I think, I don't see his position. It really has much, it's just all my opinion. No, I think you know, defining what's what, there's a, there's a whole institutional, consistent institutional orthodoxy about this is what we believe. If you want to be part of us, you accept this, this, and this. And, um, and that, I think, it, it gives it a bit more gravitas to what your opinion. You're, you're, you're sharing something with a multitude of others. You're not just simply making it in a small groups and, and, and you're coming into a sort of a, a deep unity with them. And uh, Yes, the other was just the whole issue of what theosis means. I don't think, and what it means to salvation, I don't think that the Protestant doctrine of salvation or anything really has got into a grasp in what theosis is and how that is expressed through 
um, salvation through the church and through through union. Um, so that would be why I wouldn't go down that path. I think it's just the deeper levels, but yeah, he raises some interesting challenges and I think they're reasonable. And what do you think is the weakest argument also part two? The weakest argument of... Uh, from the debate they, uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Gavin. Um, oof. <laughs> I, I can't quickly put my finger on one of them. I, I just think, um, as I say, I, I'm not getting a set up a complete co coherent alternative view of understanding what the church and stuff is. So I'm getting critiques coming out of bit and bit and bit in here, but I'm not getting, hey, look, this is what the church really is. It's this, this, and this. This is why it's this, this, and this is how it fits theology, theologically, this, this, and this. This is why the fathers taught it here, 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 here. And your opinion is, is off track because it's this, that, and the next thing. I'm not getting that full sense, and I think that is a, a weakness of it, whereas he has said at much as at least uh, I presented this, which he can go back and look in the history and go, yeah, that's what they were saying there and there, and he's going, oh, these other Orthodox may not be speaking the same thing, but, but he can see there is a logic and a consistency with the position of Agam. He may not agree with it, but, <laughs> but at least there is that sense of, there is a model, here is a framework, this is the expression, and um, yeah, that's what I hope at least I presented. Thank you. So, Dr. Gavin, weakest and uh... Uh, strongest argument from uh, Father Patrick tonight. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, just a, a brief observation too on, uh, I, I would just love to register the issue of theosis as something that'd be good to talk about more in some context. It seems to me, I'll just throw this out there that uh, actually um, the basic idea there, you can find a lot in the West too. So I would like to propose that um, that's not necessarily a divider between us, so I acknowledge it isn't how it plays out in the details and so forth. Um, uh, and if I just may reiterate too, uh, it's a fair observation that Father Patrick made that I'm not being as specific as he is with my alternative. That is true. I don't actually think that was my task in, in with respect to the proposition of this debate, but I did say the true church is found wherever Christ is present in word and sacrament. But I acknowledge that there's fuzzy edges, and I would adhere to the idea you can tell more easily where it is than where it isn't. I'm sympathetic to that way of thinking, so just a comment there. Um, Father Patrick has made many wonderful arguments. I won't really say much about weak arguments because I don't really, none of them really stood out to me as particularly weak. Um, I think the strongest arguments he has on his side, and this is a great exercise to steel man the other position, so that's why I appreciate you asking about this, John, would be from the church fathers who emphasized the necessity of the bishops, particularly Ignatius and Cyprian. That's a very powerful appeal. And then with that, the more general appeal that often is made from Orthodox to Protestant, and many Protestants are um, knocked off balance by it, namely, you're going by your opinion, we hang with the church fathers. <laughs> that's kind of the ethos, so that's kind of the feeling. And um, I actually don't think that's totally fair uh, it may be, there may be something to that, but I mean, it seems to me again, you know, every, even in the Orthodox church, you have to choose is Moscow or Constantinople, right? And then you have to choose, well, should I become Orthodox or should I stay Orthodox or not? We all, so in one sense, in a basic sense, it seems to me that private judgment is totally unavoidable. We've got to make a decision. Do I want to be Orthodox or not? So the difference there is not absolute. So in terms of why I'm not swayed by the argument from Cyprian and uh, Ignatius, it would just be what I've said, the eccentricities in Ignatius's definition of the bishop and understanding of the bishop, you know, not believing in apostolic succession, seemingly, not believing in really a bishop is over a region, but really the bishops for him are congregational. Um, and then other evidence early on for the development. Uh, and then with Cyprian, just thinking that, again, his comments are within the Roman Empire, a smaller church uh, being united over and against these heretical groups popping up that just seems to me to not uh, warrant taking that restriction without qualification into a different context. 
namely the post 1054 world. And I would just stick to my guns on saying, I don't think the filioque rises as high as Arianism or something like that in terms of importance, but we've already hashed all that out. I really don't think I can identify a weak argument. Um, I don't know. I'd have to think about that. I mean, if you really want me to, John, I'll keep scratching my brain. <laughs> I'm rather tired though, too. Yeah, yeah, it's probably that. Paul Patrick, do you have uh, do you want to comment on anything or should we? Um yeah, I'll not not too much more. I think we've covered most things. I I, I had a niggling thing I want to talk about a little bit about the the necessity again of the of the bishops and I, and just pointing out that St. John Chrysostom was reading all the same evidence and he was he had no problem with the, that 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 this was the app. The bishops were in place at that. He, he, there's no question in him that there was many anything meaning or anything other than the bishops. Um, I think you can see even in the New Testament that the way that the play between and Timothy he goes with the singular. He talks about if you want to be a bishop, he's not talking about if you want to be one of the the presbyters or any of the presbyters need to be. He, he does it in a singular way. You've got James as well, whose actions, the way he works in Jerusalem, is clearly as a single singularity among them but i think again the whole issue comes down to um uh, you can reconcile all these things by a sense that there is a synod of bishop and presbyters in the place so all equal as priests the roman uh, the byzantine liturgy for example then the, um, the bishops properly meant to be um doing the offering he takes off all his episcopal signia and he offers as a priest among priests He's the first priest. He only puts on his Episcopal insignia when he's ordaining or doing an Episcopal task as the first. So I think um, there has been an idea of as a monarchical bishops and stuff and, and separate, which is actually foreign to the tradition of a church. Um, it's like, a, and then people are reading, trying to read that back into the New, um, New Testament. So yeah, you're not going to see that. But it doesn't mean that there wasn't a structure of, of singularity of a bishop in that. So that's about the only thing I would like to say. Um, otherwise, yes, it was all cool. <laughs> Interesting. Thank you. I have so many questions more, but uh, maybe <laughs> for, 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 uh, for another time. Um, do, so this is really, this is like a, a half question. Do you think there is a path for unity or, you know, it's, do you think, or what do you think needs to happen? I mean, the Orthodox position may be, you know, come to us, you know, but, you know, what, what do you think about the Gavin, the Dr. Gavin, and what do you think about that, uh, Father Patrick? I would say that in the present circumstance, the pathway to unity is not visible. I can't see it. But the walls of division, as one has put it, don't rise so high as to heaven. <laughs> so it is not impossible. And so I would say, what do we do? A lot of hard work, a lot of talking, and a lot of humility. And that's the only way to make progress, it seems to me. And in the context of doing those things, we simply ask the Lord to do miracles. I don't know how else to approach it. Yeah, and the Orthodox Church, again, yeah, the argument is a, a hope that those outside will come into the community of the Orthodox Church, take on, um, settle into the, the, the structure of bishops and presbyters, et cetera, and, it's, um, and come into the unity. And I, but I think the Orthodox Church is, uh, there are some barriers which are, Sort of sociological barriers, which are which are an interesting problem that they need to um, overcome. The sort of some of the nationalism, etc., and and their own testimony and, and faithfulness to what they're teaching, and um, and working harder on avoiding that these horrible schisms between Constantinople and Moscow, which actually littered the tradition of the church in this way for a long time. I mean, there's been lots of these things, so hopefully it'll blow over not too soon. Um, the danger of schisms is that what happens to justify it, there are interesting and weird and wonderful teachings coming out, um, which is a greater problem than the actual split moment, uh, hopefully momentarily in itself. Um, as I said, it's not a complete sh shattering. It, uh, it's still a, a, a something in process. Um, so, but yeah, I, I think the Orthodox Church is 
uh, and mission and all the rest of it. There is a lot of Orthodox mission though. They, they, they are working very hard at, at mission, but um, there's some interesting critiques of that Orthodox can be a bit closed in on themselves and they need to spread it out. But they they are. But I, in the end, ultimately, for our solution is everyone becomes Orthodox, comes into unity of the Orthodox churches. Um, but hopefully be able to express themselves their own in their own cultural com language and their own um, cultural traditions and stuff. So the church is truly sort of um, takes it, sort of federalize it. There is a church the way of Russians and then the US is a sort of an American, whatever that means, <laughs> expression of orthodoxy. Um, so it can have some local ownership as well, which I help. So it's no longer foreigners imposing their way of thinking on it but it's become a tr truly localized church in the us or the uk uh, um etc so that's what i hope the orthodox work towards but yeah we have no other solution but them coming to us and um and coming into union of it okay is it anything you want to mention before we close that i you want to mention maybe something about uh, dr gavin you can say something about your channel uh, point people to that and also your father patrick if there is anything uh, yes, people could uh, find out more about me on my YouTube channel, which is called Truth Unites, and it's a channel devoted to both apologetics and theology in an ironic spirit. That's my uh, effort there. And um, that's it. Other than that, I would just say thank you again to Father Patrick and thank you again to you, John. I thoroughly enjoyed this, and uh, I think these are very productive. So thank you both for yeah. the opportunity. Yeah, thank you for accepting <laughs> the invitation. Mm -hmm. Father Patrick, do you have anything? Um, I have a blog, Sacred Traditions, if you want to look. When, when, or, when will you create your YouTube channel? And <laughs> oh, I don't. I'm actually not into uh, creating my own channel. I, I'm happy to come by invitation. I, I, I've been, I was invited onto the Roman Catholic channel, Reason and Theology. You'll see me pop up from there. So if, if you want me to answer a question or talk, you feel free to uh, contact me through one of the channels or um, um, from Sacred Traditions as my blog as such or Facebook. Um, I've got a secular name, John Ramsey, which I go because my Facebook's basically my secular friends and family. It's not really a church, but I get involved in discussions on papal, um, and, uh, the papacy and the filioque uh, um, doctrine is where I usually hang out if you find me there. Um, yes, so feel free, but yes, I, I don't want to set up my own channel <laughs> as such. Um, and I enjoyed this, this very interesting discussion. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's, I always enjoy these discussions. It's a matter of, I've gone through a lot of these questions and issues in the, in the past, and it's good to reflect on my own thinking and um, to bounce off other people's and challenges to it. And to, you know, it always makes help to improve one's overall understanding of reality and truth. And um, yeah, I much appreciate it. And a good civil manner where you can actually talk and at a reasonable <laughs> <and> reason. <laughs> so that, that's all great. Yeah, I can't imagine any of you be angry. <laughs> uh, so you're so calm. And uh, Dr. Gavin, you're actually, I think, uh, very brilliant. And uh, that's why I wanted you to debate this topic, because uh, you can articulate yourself and uh, explain the Protestant case uh, at uh, uh, maybe you don't believe me, but I think you you're one of the people that does it best. I think from your perspective, so it uh, I thought it would be very interesting for the Orthodox to engage that, and also, of course, Father Patrick, uh, you know what you're talking about. You have studied this on a ac academic level, so this exchange would is has been very interesting for me to listen to. Um, again, if you want to share this, you can do that. You can like and subscribe. And of course, you can also uh, visit my Patreon account if you want. So uh, thank you everyone for listening. And uh, I hope you uh, see you soon again in the channel. Please leave a comment. Uh, tell me what you thought of uh, the debate. Um, but please be civil. It's, uh, it's uh, yeah, I think we all agree about that. 
And, uh, you know, as uh, Jere uh, Jeremiah, the patriarch Jeremiah the second said, I think in his third letter was, you know, we don't agree in dogma, but let's at least not be, let's be friends at least, you know. <laughs> okay. Thank you everyone for listening and uh, goodbye.